Hello. Hey. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Richard, I can hear you. Oh, wonderful, fantastic, thank you. Hi, ah, it's, I'm just slowly loading everyone up. That's wonderful, look at all those people. Is that Tom there? Yep. Hey, Tom, are you able, how can I, um, is there an easy way of doing the Twitter? I guess we don't need to. Um, okay, hi everyone. Uh, I can see Chandler, I can see Tom, I can see Laura, I can see Jason. Uh, oh, so many people. That's fantastic. Ah, who's that? Oh, fantastic. I had this idea that um, maybe some people could unmute their mics. I know that's crazy because everyone always says mute your mics, but actually it'd be nicer if I could hear a little bit of noise. Oh yeah, that's fantastic, thank you. Oh, thanks, thanks everyone who's doing that, that's really good. If it's really noisy where you are, just mute it again, but it's sounding good. Hey everyone, hey Sarah, Oliver. Ah, I can hear the baby. Um, okay, everyone, so uh, wave at me if you'd like to start. Turn on your camera if you possibly can. Be, uh, that would be fantastically useful. Um, I have this idea that uh, even if you don't want to turn... Oh, hey, James. Um, even if you don't want to turn your camera on, so hopefully you don't mind doing that, if, if you could just take a photo of yourself with your phone or something. Ah, sorry. Uh, and, um, um, and mail it to us or post it on the, uh, the announcement page for this. Just post a photo of you sitting there and I can at least put a link up and that'd be really nice. So anyone that hasn't got their camera on, if you wouldn't mind just taking a photo of yourself and posting it, hopefully we'll get 100 photos. Okay. Um, that's fantastic. I can hear a cat. Wow. We never get that when we're at uni, do we? Already we're so much better. So, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our trial number two. I'm just looking at the other screen I've got over there, trying to see if everything seems to be working. And um, the main thing I wanted to show everyone is why I'm wearing my favorite t-shirt, the Winchester t-shirt. The Winchester Tavern t-shirt is so good. So, because um, I think it's sort of fitting at the moment because as everyone knows, the Winchester Tavern is where you need to go. Things go bad. So I reckon I'm in the Winchester. Um, so uh, let's go to the notes. I'm going to try and share my screen. Let's see if that works. Uh, I should have set the notes up if I've done it right. So you can follow along too. They shouldn't have any protection on them. The Wico 5 notes. Fantastic. Somehow... I've pulled it off this time. I can see everyone's faces and I can also see the lecture notes. It's really good because I've got two screens going. All right, um, so I'm going to uh, the slides for today, which is the module five slides, which you'd find by going to the schedule on the side and then clicking on the slide for um, week five. Hi oh, Clifford, hey, have you you've shaved your beard? I couldn't hear you, but I think that's because... So I could wear a face mask. You can wear a face Yeah, I heard lots of people were doing that. Yeah, some of my friends who are doctors are doing that too. Um, uh, so without any further ado, oh, let me just say, so with <laughs> I think one time but further ado, let me just say the context of where we are. So we're in quiet week this week, so there weren't going to be any lectures this week. So this is just because last week I didn't 
in all our experimenting around. I didn't get to cover all the stuff. Um, but uh, if I've got this working right, it's being recorded. And maybe one or, or two of you are screen recording it as well, uh, in case I stuff up. And I'll post that afterwards so people don't have to watch it. But the idea is we're going to finish all the stuff that we didn't finish from the time. Uh, and we're also just going to uh, talk and smile and see each other because I'm sort of missing or well, seeing any humans, but you guys in particular. Um, it's quite weird just being at home. So it's very nice to see everyone. So, no. um, uh, at the end of this, we're going to watch some movie, in, anyone that wants to. And I've installed Netflix Party and it seems to work. Uh, and the movie we're going to watch is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind for reasons that may or may not be clear. I think to some of you, you've probably worked it out already why. Um, and we'll talk about that after the film too briefly if we have a chance. So I hope you guys can hang around. Anyone, just can you show me a thumbs up if you're thinking of hanging around and watching it? Excellent. Fantastic. All right, that's really good. Excellent, excellent. So that should be fun. I went through a list of about 50 films that we could watch. And Netflix, oh, hey, is Lyria. Hi, Lyria. Netflix have relatively few of them. So I'm going to try and work out ways we can watch films on other mediums too, because there's lots of fantastic relevant security films, but not many on Netflix. Um, okay, so let's get going. Now this is um, actually one of my favorite topics. It's really important. And uh, in fact, it's so important that I moved it into week five. So we do it ahead of the break, even though it displays privacy, which is incredibly important, which we'll do just after. So next week we'll do privacy. So I just thought this was so important in terms of understanding security and giving you a good mindset for security. So I move the topic early. And the topic is command and control. Now that's a military phrase and it's got to do with, I mean, it's used in lots of different contexts. But uh, I've mainly come across it in a military context where it's about how the actual flow of, um, I guess, of authority and control to make the whole organization, or we could think of it as an organism, do something, how is that message transmitted all the way down and who has power to do what and things like that. That whole network of power and control, we're gonna call command and control. And the different patterns, the different ways that can happen, actually turn out to be um, relevant to, site. well, in fact, lots of areas of security too, because um, you'll often have something you want to implement. You'll have a policy you want people to follow or an effect you want to achieve. And you have this grand idea at the top, but it has to implement, trickle all the way down to all the people and things. So how does that actually all work? So it's really fun. And we're going to illustrate command and control by looking at nuclear accidents um, because uh, they're uh, fascinating. So I just want to start talking about the Cold War. Now, uh, I think I mentioned those, for those of you that saw Dr. Strangelove, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in the old days, whenever we started talking about the, the Cold War, I had to um, I had to really explain it because it was an alien idea to most people. Um, the, your your age who'd grown up in just peace and love and all that awesome stuff since history stopped, but in the last few years, it's become increasingly less necessary for me to explain the Cold War because we're sort of entering into Cold War Part Two, two point zero now which is now part of our life. And so it's quite interesting. Um, how can we be reliving that terrible mistake? You know, there's that quote about those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat history. I think our leaders and probably our populations haven't learned from history and might not know fully the history of the Cold War. So anyway, nuclear, I just want you to think about, so the rise of nuclear power sort of maps the rise of the Cold War in that it was introduced at the end of the Second World War. That's sort of what ended the um, second, uh, marked the end of the Pacific campaign, the campaign against Japan from the America and England. And, um, it was the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and then after that, the war finished and we had these two superpowers, Russia and America, who hated and distrust and disliked each other and everything they stood for. So um, there was a lot of animosity, but also they were very powerful. They each had a lot of land. They sort of divvied up all the spoils at the end of the Second World War, which is actually often what happens after a while. The victors get lots of goodies. And so they were wealthy. They had control over large areas, huge populations, uh, and they each had different political ideologies and they each were persuading uh, uh, their population that their ideology was right and the other one was bad and, and it was wrong. And so they were pitted against each other, but they didn't want to fight. So they just had this 
constant bickering and spying and doing small things. And so it was a cold war. Now, at this time, the thing that sort of kept it cold, probably, was the fact that nuclear weapons were around. So, or one of the things. So if we had a war, everyone was thinking both sides would have nuclear weapons in this war. It wouldn't be like the last one. Um, and so that could be terrible for everyone. Uh, so they didn't want to have a war, but they still wanted to keep fighting. My children are often like this. So, um, so we had the Cold War. So let's look at what happens when two people are fighting and they have unimaginably powerful and deadly weapons at their disposal that could destroy the whole planet many times over, the surface of it many times over. Um, let's look at how that plays out. So first of all, uh, if you just want to think about it from a script point of view, what are the risks? Now, the military saw a risk that the other side could attack and defeat them. Uh, and the military wanted to use nuclear weapons to assert their superiority and dominance. And that makes sense. But there is this second risk, which is that um, something goes wrong, there's a mistake or whatever, and the weapons are used and the, the terrible devastation happens and it's sort of by accident and not by intent. So this is where we get to command and control. Either, if we look at it from the American point of view, the American president says, launch the nuclear missiles. Uh, and either they launch or they don't. And if they don't, that's a particular sort of error. And if they do, that's um, a correct behaving of the system. But what if the president doesn't say launch? What are the two things that could happen? Well, they could launch or they could not launch. So you can see they are a correct behavior and an error as well. And those two errors, type one and type two, were viewed very differently by people. The military um, were more, much more concerned about weapons being, uh, they wanted to assure that if the president said launch, they could be launched. Uh, and the president saying launch and them not launching, that would be a disaster for them. Uh, whereas, um, I guess a lot of scientists a grow and a growing number of people, even philosophers like Bertrand Russell, started getting really worried about, well, what if no one says launch, but something goes wrong and the missiles do launch? Uh, that would be terrible. So that would be an accident of some sort. And we saw one sort of accident in Dr. Strangelove where just a crazy general decides to launch them. And there's other ones, I guess, where terrorists could grab them and launch them. Or the Russians could do a trick and trick the US into launching them to give them a plausible reason to fight back. Or um, uh, the bomb could just, a bomb could just go by accident in a plane and the Americans might think they're being attacked and they might fight back at Russia. Or uh, uh, they could be doing a testing run somewhere and it could act, something could go off. You know, you can start thinking of all the things that could go off. It's a little bit frightening. And uh, the president was going around, Kennedy, um, was going around just sort of checking out, well, I guess the first one to say is Truman, in the end of the war, my understanding is, and I'm not a historian, that um, the Air Force had control over the bombs because they developed them. And I don't even think he knew that the first bomb was going to be launched or what it meant in Hiroshima. I think it was Hiroshima first in Nagasaki. Uh, could be giving it back with that. Um, I don't know if he knew about the first one being launched or not, but I do know that he didn't know about the second one going, that he found out about it like everyone else did, whether it was in the papers or something else or something like that. And he was so angry. And, and he said, this is a terrible weapon. It shouldn't be launched without my say-so. And he insisted that the president has the command to launch the missile. And unless the president says yes, they can't be launched. And that began the whole command and control thing, this idea of let's set these weapons up so they can't be used without the president saying go. Uh, this is a long story, uh, a long sort of rambling thing. So I apologize. But at the end, I promise it will all make sense. Um, so uh, Kennedy, when he came to power, sent some people around to check what was happening at all the different places where the US military had their nuclear weapons. Was the arsenal under control? Was it safe? Or could it actually be used without the president knowing? And they discovered all sorts of things. And I might have mentioned one of them before. Uh, at an airfield in Turkey is the famous one. Uh, the, the, the president's envoy or whoever it was, 
discovered there was a lone jet sitting on the runway with nuclear weapons on it, ready to go, uh, or nuclear weapons in one of the domes nearby. I can't remember if it was ready to go or just nearby, but the domes anyway, where the weapons were kept, were just kept adjacent to the planes because they had a, a certain short period of time in which they had to be able to launch. Uh, and there was just one soldier guarding it and he had a rifle, like just a, a crappy rifle. Um, I, I always imagined a bolt rifle, like not even like a super duper automatic or semi-automatic thing, but maybe I'm dreaming. But I, that's, that's my recollection of it. And it was some like 19 year old guy, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Sergeant Pi, I've got a private pile, I'm looking after this plane, so don't worry. And it was in the middle of Turkey and, uh, and the, maybe the runway had a, a barbed wire around it or something. And the guy's going, oh my God, just thinking it would just take like one person with a sniper rifle and you could get a plane and nuclear weapons. And Turkey at that time was not a, a, a country that anyone felt confident um, uh, they could trust would act in alignment with American interests. They, they had their own interests as well. They'd come out of the building. So there was a serious threat that they could lose control over their arsenal. Uh, not, so notwithstanding that, um, there were also all sorts of other things that could go wrong. And the book that a lot of this is documented in is absolutely fantastic, called Command and Control by Eric Schlosser, uh, a most amazing book. I've got a reference to it at the very bottom. Uh, and he goes through, he tells a bit of a story, he follows one particular accident at a base in Arkansas. But, um, but along the way, he talks about the accidents that happened. So the danger here is, forget about the Turkey um, malicious thing, that's the danger everyone likes thinking about. Everyone always likes to think about the enemy as being the real danger. But we know from this course, usually the real danger, or often the real danger, is insiders. Uh, and insiders here aren't necessarily malicious people. They could just be incompetent people or errors or mistakes. And it turns out there was a serious risk of the nuclear weapons being used accidentally or going off. And this book documents lots of the incidents. Now, an incident where a nuclear weapon is damaged, um, dropped, or could go off, could lead to an explosion, but wouldn't necessarily lead to a nuclear war, uh, is called a broken arrow. And where uh, the accident happened and it could lead to a nuclear war, um, that's called a nuke flash, I think, or something like that. And then there's uh, another one to a bent spear. Oh, here we are. Uh, since 1950, there have been 32 nuclear weapon accidents known as broken arrows. An unexpected event involving nuclear weapons that results in accidental launching, firing, detonating, theft, or loss of the weapon. Six have been lost and never recovered. Um, oh, excuse me, you don't want to hear me sneezing there. Oh, oh. It's a completely safe sneeze, I'm going to say. I'm just allergic to nuclear weapon accidents. So, what, what we've got here is um, uh, consistently these things were dropped and mistakes were happening all the time. Uh, and some of them are so dreadful. When you read the book, you go, oh my God. Oh my God, you know, just a small line between a complete catastrophe and what happened and the public never knows. In fact, often they lied to the public. There's lots of documented things of how an accident would happen and afterwards it's like, oh, it's, um, it's safe to go to this water. I go swimming in it myself or it's safe to do this. And of course it wasn't, it was this complete lie. Um, they were flying planes loaded with nuclear weapons above um, uh, uh, Greenland, which is owned by um, uh, Denmark, I think, and uh, they promised they'd never have live nuclear weapons in the planes going over Denmark, Danish airspace, but they did. And, and they weren't supposed to have nuclear weapons flying over American airspace, over American cities, just in case of a mistake or accident, but they did. Uh, and they dropped all sorts of bombs and lost them and just never, ever confessed or ended up. Um, because I guess if, if you've got that um, particular structure that we're starting to get to, which is Everyone just has to obey the people above. You don't really want to alarm the people below. So you don't necessarily tell them the truth because you're viewing them as things you want to manipulate to not manipulate necessarily in a bad way, but you want to achieve some goal by getting all the people in the bottom to do things. So you tell them what they need to know or what will be helpful to achieve that effect. You're not really regarding them as equals or people that need to know what's going on. So lots of these accidents weren't reported. Anyway, read this book. You'll find lots of examples. I've just mentioned two in the notes that you might want to look up. Um, one is the, and I remember how to pronounce this. This is the uh, base in um, Greenland. Thule, I always call it, but it could be Thule or Thule. I have heard someone talk about it and I, when they pronounced it, I thought, oh, now I know how to pronounce it, but no, I've forgotten that already. Um, so read about that 1968 accident. You don't have to, but I think you should. It's so interesting. Um, that was the US, uh, the, uh, oh, 
dog. That's excellent. Oh, wow. When you, has anyone got a puppy? Did anyone get a puppy because of the... Um, yes, you did. Michael, did you get it because of the virus? No, I got it like a week before. I didn't even kind of consider it. But it's a good time to be home. It's a brilliant time. Is the puppy there? Uh, yep. Can we see? Uh, let me grab it. Hang on. Can everyone see Michael? Is he coming on your screen? I'm really jealous. I tried to persuade my... Oh, wow. Is it a she? Does it... Oh. Is it a she, Michael? Yeah, she. Her name's Stevie. Hey, Stevie. Like Stevie Nick. Yeah. That's awesome. And what sort of dog is it? A cavoodle. A cavoodle. Oh, we've got a cabbie. We've always had cabbies. Yeah, yeah. It's like a cabbie, but smart. I understand. Well done. Well, hello, Stevie. It's lovely to welcome you to the course. We should all bring dogs to the next lecture, I think. Um, I tried, I was saying, I, while you were getting a Michael, I tried to persuade my family that we should get puppies uh, to sit out this whole period of being at home. But everyone said no. Uh, but I'm sure they'll regret that because it would have been so good. Oh, well, the only problem is every time I walk her, everyone's trying to pat her. So like people are coming, like approaching me and coming near me and I'm like, back off. How can you solve that problem? That's a puzzle. I just, yeah, no, I just kind of walk away, cross, well, cross the road. You could cough or something? Yeah, or sneeze you on them. Cover it with some sort of mucusy thing or something. More vicious looking dog. <laughs> ah, anyway, awesome, awesome, awesome. Well done. Thanks, Michael. And thanks for leaving your mic on. That was really nice. Um, okay, so uh, uh, read about the Tule incident. Um, that's a very interesting one. Uh, massive amounts of uh, the area were contaminated uh, because they lost the bomb. Now, oh yeah, I should say the hydrogen bombs, or uh, lots of the bombs anyway, often had plutonium in them. And the problem with plutonium, it's good from a bomb point of view, but it's incredible. It's got a, a reasonable half-life, and if it turns into dust and gets into your lungs, it's deadly. Uh, and even tiny amounts of it blowing around in the air are deadly. So if something goes wrong, oh, and, and of course how nuclear weapons work, don't listen if you're an evil spy from another country that wants to become a nuclear power, because I'm sure we're not allowed to talk about this, but here's the secret of how nuclear weapons work. There's a couple of bits of material that if you put them together, everything will explode. And you have to put them together really quickly. So often how they do that is they put conventional explosives on the outside to drive them, to, they explode that, and then they boom, drive into the middle and explode. So if you think about it, your nuclear weapon has all these radioactive blobs in it ready to squish into the middle with a whole lot of high explosive around them to make them go in. It's like there's so many ways it could explode. And if it gets hot, it might explode. Some of them, if you drop them or hit them in the wrong spot with a hammer, they could explode. So depending on what the detonator is. Uh, so when you have accidents with these weapons, like none of them ever went off. We're lucky. I don't, I don't know of a nuclear explosion that went off when a bomb was dropped though lots of them nearly did, as you'll find when you read the book. But the ex often the explosive material went off that drives them together and just luckily didn't drive them together. And when that happens, you get plutonium everywhere. And that's, that's just deadly. And so up in Greenland, when they dropped uh, some of these bombs and there was a terrible fire, uh, it contaminated so much land and they had to dig up all this um, snow and land and then uh, like bazillions and bazillions of tons of it and ship it all to somewhere and store it safely. Um, uh, so the contamination problem is a nightmare. And that's actually why we're a bit worried about satellites and things that use plutonium batteries. Uh, if something goes wrong on re-entry or the thing explodes or something bad happens, uh, then now you've got plutonium everywhere. And there have been, there was one, I think it was a Russian that re-entered recently a while ago that had, oh, you're, you're nodding Clifford. Do you know the details of this? Uh, I can't hear you, but I think, your mic, mate. I think you said that. But we, but um, hey, hey, <laughs> um, so uh, uh, and in fact, I even think there was a wasn't there a plutonium battery left at the top of Mount Everest or something, and then now it's been lost. No one knows what it is. It's just this stuff that's horrible that has this huge environmental impact for ages, and it just gets lost and we lose it all the time. So plutonium's very bad to use. So accidents and disasters for all sorts of things. So read about the Thule accident. Uh, the Russian one that happened just last year, you're probably all reading about, I know I was obsessively when it was happening. Russia was very coy about what was going on and there was all this stuff in the press about this and that and then Trump started tweeting that finally confused things more. But um, uh, it looked like it was a nuclear um, uh, 
test, missile tests that went wrong, and it looked like there probably was, well, there certainly was radioactive spill and waste because they picked it up in um, Norway. Uh, um, they could detect the increase in background radiation. And this is part of that, every contact leaves a trace. Whenever you do anything, it often just leaves a trace. So that's how we enforce nuclear test ban treaties because they create seismic things that you can pick up with seismic waves through the earth. Uh, and when bombs go off, they leave a little signature of radioactive particles that you can pick up in the distance. So Chernobyl, the Russians could say what they want about Chernobyl, but we were, when the wind was blowing towards Europe and we were measuring the radiation in the air. Um, so that's another example of a sideway, uh, a side channel, uh, but they're just everywhere, these side channels. Um, and yeah, you might want to read about the Russian explosion. That's interesting, what we do know about it and what we don't. But it's just clear that we have these terrible weapons that could cause terrible destruction. And all these accidents just demonstrated over and over again, not really looking after them. So we've just been lucky. And we've talked about luck and risk before. Um, we've just been lucky we haven't had a serious nuclear explosion or, or, or um, worse. And of course, the real danger is if these things happen and people don't understand quickly enough why they happen, like if America dropped a bomb on itself or something like that, which has happened several times, and it does blow up and actually goes off. It's possible that they could think a Russian did it and retaliate against Russia or China or someone. Um, and you might say, no, that would never happen. When people are flustered and stressed, they never blame other people for what's going wrong. And of course, we just had that happening yesterday when, um, uh, like all those people went to Centrelink and the, the website went down. Do you remember that? Someone posted it on Open Learning. Uh, the first thing the minister said is, oh, cyber attack. The site went down because it was cyber attack. And my only comment to that was, yeah, and a dog ate my lunch because um, a dog ate my homework because it's just such an obvious, plausible excuse. And then two hours later, he had to come back and say, oh, actually, I was wrong. It's just our site was crap and we hadn't built it properly and thought about this thing happening. That's why it went wrong. It wasn't someone else's fault. But of course, after you've launched a nuclear strike, two hours later, you can't say, oh, sorry. Yeah, actually, it wasn't really a nuclear strike. Oh, Laura, what are you doing? Are you outside, really? Or is that a... Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm so jealous. Oh, wow. <laughs> what, what are you, what state are you in, in the North or South? What state? Yeah. New South Wales. And in the North? Uh, south. In the South. Oh, I'm so jealous. Oh. Very bad of sec, yeah. <laughs> who else, who else is jealous? <laughs> Yeah, but Gloria, you're in the country, I can see. No, it's a background picture. Oh, oh damn, you <laughs> tricked me. <laughs> okay, uh, am I pronouncing it right? Is it Gloria? I'm saying it like the girl's name. Yeah, it's my girlfriend, she's here. No, but she doesn't want to be in the... Uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, Gloria, we all, but we all know about you because your name is here. But hello, hello, hello. So what's your name? Oh, Giannis. Say it more slowly. Giannis. Giannis. Yeah. Giannis. Hello, Giannis. Um, okay. So you might want to read about that. And then I've said something about toilets. Just because if we're talking about side channels um, and every contact leads a trace, uh, a famous, uh, some famous research on drug use in prisons years ago, they did all sorts of things to work out if people were taking drugs or not. They asked them, they measured, they did sampling and things. But it turned out the most accurate measure they could do was to um, just examine the sewerage and look for traces of chemical in there because you can't hide that. Uh, and they found large amounts of um, illicit materials were being consumed inside the jail, although they couldn't find out where it was coming from. And in the uh, 80s and 90s, when cocaine was everywhere, uh, they used to do analysis just on random banknotes because people used to put the cocaine on the banknote and roll nuts and all that. Um, I'm not exactly sure of all the details, but it involved banknotes and powder. And that means that microscopic traces were left. And at some point, I think there was an estimate that half of the banknotes in America had cocaine traces on them or something. So there, you can't help but leave little side channels going on there. I've often thought that if you wanted to know where someone was, if a building was being used or uh, that looked empty, was actually empty, all you do is you go along one day and look at the water meter, and then you go a month later and look at the water meter again. And you can see, because there's a meter on the outside of the building, you can see how much water has been consumed. I bet the people hiding in there, trying to make it like Asia or something, trying to make it look like no one's in there, wouldn't think to uh, bypass the water meter. So anyway, there's always side channels. Uh, and broken arrows are interesting. Read about them. Uh, the, the, this, um, the cruise missile story is really interesting too. Uh, they 
um, loaded some test missiles on a plane for a testing run, but they accidentally put live nuclear warheads in them. That happened quite a few times. And then no one knew that it was important, so they were unloaded and left somewhere. And this, just in a storeroom were sitting six live nuclear thermonuclear hydrogen bombs uh, uh, with no one guarding them, just sitting there. Uh, and then they got them all back. So anyway, the moral of this whole story is that there is this terrible risk that you don't look after things yourself. And um, it's very hard. And, and, and often your biggest danger is looking after things yourself. So now we get back to command and control. And, and the thing was the president wanted to make sure that only the president can launch. So how can the president enforce that when all the people under them are doing stupid things, all these mistakes are happening, people are dropping things, accidents happen all the time. Um, how can you actually enforce your power all the way down? It's very hard. And that's what we're about to talk about. There's the book and there's another book. They're both really good. Weapon safety. Yeah, there's a lot about weapon safety in these books. And also there's a couple of really good um, shows and podcasts about nuclear weapon safety. You might want to find out. But basically, um, the people making the bombs in the old days made them so they'd explode. And a, an error was you drop the bomb and it doesn't explode. So they went for a lot of effort to make sure that when you drop the bomb, it did explode. And it wasn't for quite a while till people started asking the question, noticing that all these accidents were happening. And the accidents weren't even being logged or documented for a while. It was really even find, hard to find out. Everyone was just saying, yeah, no accidents, everything's fine. But when they started investigating and looking down, they found, oh, oh, uh, a whole, uh, let me just tell you one funny accident. They flipped the wiring accidentally on, a, on one of the missiles on the switch that goes between safe and armed. So whenever you set it to safe, you were setting it to armed. And whenever you set it to armed, you were setting it to safe. And then SAC insisted that every time they uh, fly, they use live missiles on the planes to do a proper test. But they always set them to disarm. But this plane was flying around with live missiles. Uh, and <laughs> no one even knew. And they can go off for a whole range of things, including height. They can be height sensitive or impact sensitive. Or, you know, um, so... Uh, I mean, obviously, there's more mechanics before they go off, but it's just very dangerous to have them. To the extent that if you on the ground and just dropped it or bumped it, it might go off if it's armed. So, um, so these mistakes happen all the time. So after a while, some people started saying, these missiles need to be made safe. These weapons we've got need to be made safe against us. We need to make sure they don't go off. We need to make sure mistakes don't happen. Or if mistakes do happen, it's not a disaster. So they came up with this idea of one point safe. And one point safe was if how essentially... How, how the question they're interested in is what does it take to make it go off? So if it got shot with a rifle bullet, would it go off? If it got if it's if it was possible just to find one point on the bomb that where if you impacted that point, the bomb would go off, then that would be dangerous. And if you could build the bomb so there's not one single point on it that will make it go off, so you'd have to hit it with two bullets or drop it twice or drop it in two points, that was one point safe. So it was safe against this one point being hit. So uh, now you see this, this idea we're gonna come up, we're gonna keep starting to come up to a whole lot of times. It's basically the idea of fail safe, that when something goes wrong, it's not a catastrophe. You build it so it takes more than one thing going wrong for the thing to go off. Um, now the, there were different explosives they used. So some of the explosives uh, couldn't be detonated in a fire and some of the explosives could be detonated in a fire. So if you've got those high explosives around the nuclear things, which one do you think you should use? The one that can or can't be detonated in a fire, given that the biggest accident danger when you're flying around in these flying fuel tankers up in the air is that one could just crash or something could go off. Often on the runway, they would just burst into flames for various reasons and accidents. And people would all be standing around nervously hosing them, knowing their live nuclear weapons on board. At that time, you're really hoping they've used the explosive that doesn't go off when it gets hot. You've used another explosive. But actually the Army and the Air Force, in this case, kept using the wrong one because it was cheaper and more reliable and they tested it and so forth. Um, but of course for safe, and it was very hard for anyone to make um, anyone concerned about safety. No one wanted to talk about it. And, and I think this is um, part, a, a sort of human nature thing, that when we focus on a problem, we can focus on that to the extent of all others and we become a bit blind to the others. So everyone was so paranoid about the Russians and the Cold War, and everyone was so determined that their weapons would work and so on, that no one was thinking about the other risks. And almost if you stood up and said, I think we should make these bombs a bit safer so they're a bit hard to go off, 
And that would mean, of course, as we all know, that sometimes they won't go off when you want them to go off. And we know just that's a consequence of fixing one area, you increase the other. Um, even if you spend a lot of money. Uh, and then people would look at you and go, don't be crazy. We can't make these bombs so they don't go off. What if, we're, what if the whole American future life depends on it going off? It's the only one being dropped at a critical spot. You know, we, and it didn't go off because of this stupid namby-pamby thing you put on. Um, so um, I, I now want to talk about the coronavirus. So with the coronavirus, we've got the same thing. I think we're all obsessing and thinking about it as much as anyone ever did about the Cold War. And that's a good thing because now we've got all our collective minds thinking about it and all sorts of good thinking is going on and we'll come up with good solutions. But there's also that same danger we had in the Cold War that if we just think about that to the extent of all others, it's the big exciting attention grabbing thing at the moment, um, then we'll start to neglect other things. So it's quite possible, like after 9-11 happened, a whole lot of bad legislation was brought in uh, in America because no one wanted to talk about Tai Tua as everyone was just saying, let's get the law fixed up so we can attack these terrorists and stop terrorists in the future. But at the same time, a whole lot of other bad things got in through the law because no one was worrying about those other bad things. And if you make your nuclear weapons, so they do go off all the time when you want them to, um, that's good, but then bad things can happen, like they're more dangerous just sitting around, uh, and that's something no one notices. So I think that's probably our biggest risk with corona at the moment, is that bad things, um, other things are going to happen because we've got our attention off them. And I think I talked about that before when I was talking about um, Bush uh, and how they did a pandemic simulation online when he was president, and he became so obsessed with, I think, smallpox. Uh, uh, they did, did quite a good thing in, in making America safe against the smallpox attack, but Lots of other things got neglected at the same time. Uh, so we do have to be careful with that. So anyway, that's what happened with weapon safety. No one wanted to know about it. The one person that eventually did write up the military train of command officially reporting it because no one was interested, um, essentially he was a whistleblower. He was a bit blacklisted and his career went a bit bad after that. Um, uh, the A-bomb pin code, I think someone's already talked about that, but one of the things the um, uh, president insisted is that there be... Um, uh, things called permissive action links. Uh, I'm trying to remember, PALS, I'm trying to remember what it stood for. Um, I think it was permissive action links. And these were, they, they basically he insisted that devices be put on the bomb. That meant the bomb couldn't go off without an order from him. So if you got hold of a bomb, it's still no good. You can't launch it, you can't, or well, you can launch it, but it won't explode uh, unless the president's typed something. So the one way they were trying to, um, implement that was putting pin codes on them and then uh, the president would release the pin code uh, just before the attack and then everyone type the pin codes in. Now you can see already now there's a danger of things going wrong with this so maybe your attack won't work because the phone line goes down and you can't harm the bomb or whatever but it did mean the president could be sure that it wouldn't go off without him authorizing the pin code. But um, uh, does anyone know? I'm pretty sure a couple of people talked about it already. What was the pin code they put in on the bomb? I think it was a six digit code. All the bombs had the same pin code. Does anyone know? Anyone want to guess? Oh, all of us got cats. That's awesome. Oh yeah, it was zero, 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 zero. So there you go. Um, so people defeated the mechanism. So even though they looked like they had a mechanism there, they didn't. So command and control. That was all the preamble to set the context. Now let's think of the problem in general. I like to think about it like this. I don't know if you've seen the movie um, uh, Avatar. It's uh, a very strange movie. Uh, but in it, who's seen it? Not if you've seen it. Yeah, yeah. And you've certainly seen shows like it, like a whole lot of Japanese animes like this. I'm pretty sure even Transformers and things all like this. And maybe even the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, if you go back in time, it's like this. The idea was in Avatar, there was this have I told you this already? Yes? No. Uh, uh, there was this big suit and the hero, I can't remember much about the movie except they had a rare element called unobtainium, which I thought was very funny. Um, they had, but I do remember they had a big suit and the hero climbs in the big suit and holds these controls. And then by moving the controls in his suit, then he's inside some sort of giant robot and it mimics his movements and it's much larger than him. Uh, like surgeons can do, you know, they put on these gloves and then they do an operation using the gloves and a million miles away at some place, the robot hands carry out the operation mimicking the person's glove. But in Avatar, the point was he was 
a small person operating these controls, but he was in some sort of ginormous machine that massively magnified his power. So if he went boom like this, then the massive machine would go boom and it'd be incredible. Okay. So um, I think of armies as being a bit like that. That you've got one person at the top that has this idea, like, let's attack that hill, attack it now. And then somehow through the mechanism of command and control, that goes down to a million people or a thousand people or a hundred thousand people, and they all run up that hill and attack it. And that, uh, and then the general says, uh, everyone now dig trenches over there. And then everyone digs trenches and suddenly there's a million trenches everywhere because this general's controlling a million people. Um, so that's uh, pretty cool. And it gives the general enormous power. So if the general then puts on his robot suit and the general of the other country puts on his robot suit, then whoever's got the biggest army, the biggest robot, uh, will tend to win. So you can see why generals like this. And it's no good if you're doing this and you say, everyone attack that hill now. And then someone says, I don't really want to. Or can I do it later on, like my daughter say? Or say, wash out the dishes. No, can I do it later on? I need to do procrastination first. Or, yeah, let's debate about that. I mean, you want to attack that hill? I think we should, you know, if everyone's doing that, then you don't have your whole suit magnifying everything. You've got a whole lot of people talking and bickering and arguing and debating amongst themselves and your half-hearted plan doesn't get carried out. So this is whole idea in the military and here I'm speaking with no actual real experience in the military at all. So I could be completely wrong, but I'm certainly reading a lot of ripping yarns books when I was young and about um, all sorts of things like that. My understanding of the military is this, that uh, one thing that's very um, valued is this chain of command thing. And then when you get an order, you have to carry it out and you can use intuitive, your intuition and um, cunning and, 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 and clever thinking to carry out the order better or work out good ways of carrying it out. But you would never question the order. You do what you're told. That's what you have to do. I mean, that's a whole Nuremberg thing. Isn't it? So the idea being um, that's the old fashioned idea. And I sort of think of it as being like pyramids. Um, so I often think the King of England, the Pharaoh uh, of Egypt, the Pharaoh would say, you know, when I'm dead, I don't want a normal size grave. I want something shaped like this, uh, but I want it really big, really, really big. Everyone do it now. Uh, and then everyone in Egypt just drops everything and builds this thing for the, for the Pharaoh and they move all these blocks around and, and they build this pyramid. And what I think is so funny about that is of course, that's exactly what they're drilling is a picture of the power structure that the, the Pharaoh invented. It's entirely a pyramid power structure with him at the top giving orders and everyone down the bottom carrying it out. So that's pretty cool. But here's my, and there's, you can see lots of good things about having a tight command and control in a pyramid shape. And you can probably see, think, imagine and think of lots of other ones. But there is a problem too, which is the general or the Pharaoh has the strength of a million people, but the Pharaoh only has still the brain of one person. So you've got a normal person with really big muscles. Whereas if everyone talks a bit and debates and argues and thinks about it and has individual, individual agency and things like that, then you've got a million people all doing a million things. A lot of them cancel each other out, but you've got a million brains in there. So you have the potential to be more creative or more lateral thinking. And I remember reading these ripping yarn books when I was a boy, the desert rats, the idea of um, people being, uh, guerrilla forces, essentially. So you're up against some big army, like the German army in the desert. But instead of attacking the army with another army equally big, these people just did little commando raids and they went behind the enemy lines and they all did individual crazy things and it really confused the other army and it just was really powerful and effective. And in a way, that's what terrorists do too. I mean, once you have a really big, organized, synchronized power structure in society, then these little, little things that come in that can make little changes unexpectedly without announcing they're invading and having a big visible army moving in everyone marching lockstep that you could sort of stop or see. But just one little lone person looking just like everyone else causing a bit of chaos. Actually, that can be quite disruptive. Uh, and often they're called stainless steel rats, if you've ever read Harry Harrison, this idea that even in a big stainless steel city in the city of the future, you still have little rats going around that can do things. So that's my thought about power structure B. So power structure A is the pyramid has the strength example is very effective. Everyone's working in unison. Lots of amazing things can happen. And then power structure B where maybe we've got no power at all and everything's all equal and everyone's arguing and debating and 
forming committees deciding what to do. Well, that's very much harder to achieve anything, but, um, but you've got lots more creative thinking going on. So now it's, hopefully you know from this course, we're never gonna say one of these is good and bad, you know, you just fit for purpose and each one of them has strengths and weaknesses. But if you just stick to one of those, then it's not ideal. So then if we go back to the whole um, Corona thing again, it's pretty clear uh, from reading, if, if, if all the information is correct, that uh, China adopted a command and control structure and was very effective. There was one person saying we should do this and they did it and they carried it out ruthlessly and in synchrony and it's amazingly effective. And then Italy had this big chaotic mess with everyone talking about what they're going to do and the government saying, oh, we should isolate now. And some people say, yeah, I don't know, I still want to go to football. And, and maybe they had a more fun time over there, but in time of crisis, sometimes you just need everyone to act together to solve the problem. And everyone doing different things is actually a bit of a problem. So um, you, you can see that there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, and I suspect our... We're seeing that playing out now with America versus um, China in the corona thing. America's got this complete chaotic, everyone doing everything. Um, uh, and maybe that'll work. Uh, maybe they'll, you know, pull through it amazingly well somehow and they'll be really well equipped. And then China's going to the other extreme and maybe that'll work. And then we're sort of in the middle and maybe, maybe that'll, I don't know. But it's sort of interesting to see the, to what extent do you want to have command and control rigorous command and control enforced from above and to what extent you want to have individual freedom and liberty and creativity now the um to talk a little bit and i've called that centralization versus decentralization but of course it's much more than that i just want to talk about a little bit of history just to put it in context so the greeks um were wealthy they had a, a lovely uh they were in sort of an intersection of a whole lot of trading routes um the early uh early cities uh they they had a lovely climate, everything was good. Uh, and they had kings, like everyone did in those days, that took most of their wealth from them. And then the people in Athens eventually got really annoyed that they, they had a city, eventually with a lot of people that started acting together. And they said, it's not really fair, the king just doesn't do anything and takes all our money. And we do all the work and he takes the money from us. And they united and together throughout the king. Now they couldn't have done that if it was just one or two of them, but the city had a whole lot of people in it. And then they acted in synchrony uh, and coordinated attack and that together they were more powerful than the king and they got rid of the kings. And they said, we will never have kings again. We want to just rule ourselves and look after ourselves. So then they invented this idea of democracy, which was everyone has a vote and everyone has a say. And they tried to set up a power structure without kings. Now, what's the danger here? Um, the danger, the fear they always had was one day the kings will come back as we've seen in countries around the world recently. I'll talk about that in a second. You throw out the person that's the bully that bullies everyone around and everyone's all nice, but then the bully somehow gets back. The Canadians have a great example of this um, where, uh, uh, anyway, I won't, I won't talk about that. Uh, but it's very funny. Uh, I'll tell you one day. Uh, it's a funny story maybe I'll tell. But anyway, so the idea was the Greeks thought, how can we stop these kings coming back? Because we still need to have someone in charge. If everyone just sits around arguing all the time, we'll never get anything done. The roads will never get built. The sewer will never be put in place and the rubbish will never be picked up. We do need a boss to tell us what to do. We kind of anarchy. Um, so, but as soon as we pick a boss, what's going to stop them grabbing more and more and more power for themselves? And then eventually there'll be a king again. Uh, and they put in place, they thought about it really hard and they put in place a whole lot of mechanisms to stop that happening. And those mechanisms they came up with two and a half thousand years later are still the basis for most democracies that are effective. And the democracies that don't put their good ideas in place tend to get overthrown and go back to authoritarian regimes and the democracies in name only. So what were their mechanisms? Well, you might want to look it up and think about it, but let me tell you some of them from my reading of it. But uh, they're, they're certainly well worth studying because they wanted to solve this problem. They came up with a really good solution to it. Oh, by the way, if you compare Athens and Sparta, you're sort of comparing the two command and control structures. Um, so here's the uh, thing. They said, we'll appoint someone to be in charge, but we won't appoint one, we'll appoint two. And they called them praetors or something or consuls or something like that. And then they each had equal power. So they had two people doing it. What's the advantage of two? Does someone want to say? Why not one? Crickets, that's so awesome. I've always wanted to ask a question, there to be silence and then just crickets. And now it's happened, it's my dream come true. Uh, or, or tumbleweed, 
maybe uh, Lauren, is there a tum- tumbleweed behind you somewhere? Oh, I'll keep an eye out if I spot one rolling past. Thank you. I'm going to build one. That's going to be my uh, project. <laughs> so, yeah, what do you reckon? Someone say. Anyone? Less chance of both of them going and trying to get maximum power when you have someone to keep in tow. That's absolutely right. Sorry, Lauren, I don't want to pick on you and make you do it. <laughs> um, but that was an awesome answer. Yeah, uh, basically their interests don't exactly align. Did I tell you that line from the Thomas Crown Affair? Did I say that already? When, Mr. Crown, when would you ever, is there a, can you imagine any circumstance in which you'd ever trust a woman? Because he doesn't, never wants to get in a relationship. Uh, and he says, yeah, if her interests didn't diverge too far from my own. And I thought, that's not about relationships and love. That's about life. You can trust someone if their interests line up with yours. Uh, and so what the Greeks tried to do is very clever. They tried to get two people whose interests didn't exactly line up. So it's harder for them to collude. And so if one of them went bad, the other would be good. Uh, and of course, if they did line up, then you're in trouble. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and then... But uh, they did all sorts of other things, like the term of that person was very short. This is something that most democracies have. Uh, so if you're in power, it just, you can't help it. The more you're in power, the more you like it. And you try and set things up to keep the power there and to make life more comfortable for you. And a great example of this is schools. Uh, if any of you know someone who's a student teacher about to go to a school, ask them to do an investigation for you and tell you what it's like. Because I bet, I bet a million dollars, um, I bet the tumbleweed that I'm about to construct, that when they go to their school, they will get all the crap classes. They'll get the classes no one wants. They'll get the trouble classes. They won't get the fun classes. They'll get to teach, I don't know, year nine, the bottom violent class. And they'll get all the nasty things. Why is that? Surely classes are handed out randomly or fairly? No, it turns out the longer you're in a school, the more powerful you get, the more people listen to your opinion, the more people are a little bit scared of you maybe or something. So the more senior teachers are more powerful and lo and behold, they tend to get better classes. So people, when in power, just tend to use the power to advance their aims. And if you like being in power, then one of your aims is to keep power. So it's more or less invariable that as soon as you get into power, you try and change things so you can stay in power. Can anyone think of examples of that happening? Oh, so the Greek thing is, oh, sorry, I should say, the Greek thing is you can't be in power for too long. So once you're in there for a year or six months, you're gone. And then we appoint two more and then two more and two more. And the idea is hopefully no one can actually stuff up the system enough in those 12 months to keep them in power. Can anyone think of examples of uh, countries which have this rule that you can't be in power for too long? And can you think of times it's been broken? Russia. Russia right now, Putin. He's so funny, isn't he? You've got to read this. Uh, and they've got a president and a prime minister and they're supposed to not be aligning, but they're best friends. In fact, I think the other one, and I can't remember which is which, because I think Putin, if I'm, I'll, I'll probably get it backwards, but I think he was prime minister. I think he was prime minister, prime minister. I think he could only be prime minister for two terms. So then he became president for the next term and put his sock puppet in his prime minister. And then I think he was president for a while. And then he decided he'd become prime minister again, because you can. And now he's been in prime minister again, or president, I can never remember which, for twice. Whichever one he is becomes, for the time he's in it, the powerful real position. Um, now his, his time's about to elapse and it looks like he can't, by the constitution, be president or prime minister any longer. So what's he trying to do? Does anyone know? Do you know Tom? Yeah, he's, he's trying to keep power. I think he's trying to modify the constitution. He's modifying the constitution. Guys, we've got to change this. There's this crazy rule in there that says I can't be president anymore. And I think there's even a vote coming up and he still wants to hold it, even with COVID happening and everything like that. He wants everyone else to go out and vote so he can keep his power. But it's not just him. I think if you started watching the news now, you'll find in every country, people try and extend the power and their time in power. And, um, and the idea of having two people that you have to uh, coerce to get power, that's called uh, checks and balances. That's an example of a check and or a balance. So you try and have things that limit your power when you're in power, so you can't just do what you want. So we have checks and balances in Australia. What limits the power of the prime minister? Crickets. Crickets. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so laws do. Uh, he has to follow the law. Well, he can change the law. Oh, yeah, but we've got the Constitution. The Constitution set up to be really hard to change for that exact reason. Um, oh, okay. 
well then does he have to obey the law well he doesn't control the police the police are sort of independent there's they should be part of the operational side part of the um uh you know the public service side and the public servants who carry out his orders they're supposed to be sort of independent of the politicians and the judges who decide yes or no and about how you can change laws and when you can change laws they're again independent and they're actually so independent that they're appointed for life so or until they get old and senile so or old so um that means the they don't even have to suck up to the government to get their appointment renewed because the government can't get rid of them. So they are like the two praetors that um, were checks and balances. So we have all these checks and balances in the system. But you can see, as soon as someone gets into power, the first thing they try and do is undermine all the checks and balances. So they'll grumble about the judiciary and try and run them down in the public's eyes. And they'll, if the judges ever do anything they don't like, they'll say, oh, the judges are making law, that's not right. And they'll take over the public service. And they, they actually have, that happened about... Um, uh, happened more than 10 years ago, they, they changed all the leaders of all the areas of the public servants to be political appointments on short-term contracts with KPIs with the discretion of the government to renew them or not. And by corroding the person, person at the top, whose job it is now is to keep the minister happy rather than look after their portfolio and do their job, um, by corrupting at the top, then the corruption sort of goes the whole way down because everyone has to be on the person first. So the public service is being eroded. We have sometimes something called the fifth estate, which is the newspapers, that if you're doing bad stuff, newspapers report on it. In a sense, they're, if you think of the country as like a system, they're a whistleblower in the system and they're alerting people when things go wrong. So then governments will try and um, the, the media that don't support the government, the governments will try and corrupt and, or, or corrode and run down or disempower um, or defund or... Uh, yeah, so for example, Trump hates all, all the media that brought, draw attention to him and um, yeah, he's effectively disempowering them quite a lot. Um, this whole idea of fake news is quite a deadly idea. So you'll see leaders do this all the time. So find some countries around the world where it's happening. You don't have to pick Australia or America, it happens everywhere. I think uh, lots of South American countries have done it recently. I'm pretty sure the Philippines have done it. I think, um, oh, Malaysia, of course, is a classic example. Um, just look up countries and you'll find that people get to power and then, oh, oh, Turkey, Turkey, Turkey. Oh, what happened in Turkey? Um, uh, uh, so read about that. The prime minister or whatever he's called, the president, whatever. Uh, amazing. Amazing how he's managed to uh, undermine checks and balances left, right and centre and turn it into an effective dictatorship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lots of those examples. Even Iran. Even so um, look look at those and see that's just natural naturally what happens with power so uh we looked at kings we looked at democracy uh yeah so this is the other thing i wanted to get to so uh, draco um who's in the time of the greeks uh he was one of the first people that brought in laws that everyone had to follow i mean they had laws before that were sort of verbal but he wrote them all down so it was sort of um written down laws and that was a check and a balance on everyone the law was sort of bigger than individual people you had to obey the law the reason uh, draconian, the word draconian is named after Draco, is all his laws were really mean and strict. Uh, and you might have encountered organisations that have rules like that. So he was, you know, basically, if you stole a cabbage, off with your head. His, 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 <laughs> every law said, and if you break this law, death. If you break this law, death. Parking after 3 p.m. in a clear way, death. <laughs> um, so, uh, but... Uh, that was interesting. And then the Romans, who copied a lot of the ideas from the Greeks in setting up a system, a command and control system for power, and again, trying to stop power becoming concentrated and, um, uh, and essentially trying to stay a republic rather than becoming an empire again with an emperor who's a, you know, a leader. They had this... Uh, oh, no, sorry, I'm still in the time of the... Oh, no, I can't remember if it's the Greeks or the Romans. Does anyone remember? Oh, I was going to say it's the Romans, the dictators. But were the dictators for the Greeks? I think it was the Romans, um, but the Greeks had a similar idea. But the word dictator actually was initially a good word, not a bad word. What it meant was in a time of crisis, we, we love sitting around talking in our togas and, and, and debating and arguing and having silly plays and things. You know, we, we're Greeks or Romans or whoever we are. I can't remember the number, I'm sorry. Um, we love doing all that, but we realise that in times of crisis, you can't do that. You need a strong leader who's going to lead and everyone to unify and suddenly everyone needs to form a robot and we need to be really big and be able to smash hills and things like that. So they would temporarily appoint someone called the dictator for just six months and their job would be to solve this problem. Uh, and they had various roles, but this is one of them. I can't pronounce Latin. Anyone that can pronounce Latin might be able to say it. But they were, this 
appoint them for the matter to be done. So that's sort of what we need now with coronavirus. We really just need to appoint a dictator to come in and just take control of the situation. Everyone has to obey their laws and they deal with the crisis because for a crisis, the dictator is a really good thing. You do want everyone to be a robot carrying out things. But the main, the main trick is the dictator at the end of the six months or as soon as the thing was over, whichever happened sooner, they had to stop being a dictator and just went back to being a normal citizen. And the danger here, I guess, is that there'll be lots of power accreting up to the states and the large financial organisations to deal with this crisis. And everyone will say, stop checks and balances, let's just go for it, let's go nuts. And they will solve the problem. But at the end, you'll end up with a system, because this is what always happens, where the people in power are now much more powerful and they won't give it back. And they won't want to put end clauses on the end of the thing. And, you know, that's the sort of how things work. Okay, so what's the danger with um, a dictator? Because you might think a dictator, I mean, it sounds like a good model. If you had a benevolent dictator, someone who's really nice and wise, and that they had ruthless, um, uh, like in, for example, in the Los Terry Pratchett books, the, the head of uh, the city, Lord Patrician, uh, he was a dictator, but he's a benevolent dictator. And Terry Pratchett points out, in a way, that's a really good thing to have, someone with awesome powers who uses them for good and can actually get things done. Um, the danger with a dictator is this concept we keep coming back to over and over again, which is single points of failure. I'm just talking all the time and you're not seeing me. You're seeing that slide, the same slide for hours. How boring was that? And I was juggling and doing all sorts of things and I showed you my tumbleweed and now oh, it's gone, I don't know where it's gone. Um, so I put my face back on, can you see me? Hello, hello everyone. Hello. Um, so dictators, um, uh, uh, or the whole robot idea, the emperor idea, the pyramid idea. The problem is the top is a single point of failure. So if the person, and this was the problem the Americans faced, that they refused to sort of admit, I think, during the nuclear thing. They didn't want to have it that the soldiers had free will, essentially. They had to carry out the orders of their officers, and the officers had to carry out the orders of their officers, and those officers had to carry out the orders of those officers, all the way to the generals, and the generals had to carry out the orders of the president. And the whole thing's absolutely perfect as long as your president is awesome. But if your president's an idiot and issues orders that you really shouldn't be following, well, wow, that's tricky. What should you do? So it's a single point of failure. If you've got a whole system where you've got the brain of one person and the muscles of a million, and the, that one person's really just a giant baby or an idiot or corrupt or something like that, then you're in big trouble. And we're seeing that with the show um, uh, that's just coming out that I haven't seen, I don't know if I'm going to, called The Plot Against America, based on an excellent book by Philip Roth, where they look at what would happen to America if a dictator did come to power. Uh, and of course, it would be really popular with people. People like strong leaders that get things done. But of course, what they'll do is they'll accrete power to themselves. Um, okay, now let's keep going. The Plot Against America, checks and balances. Uh, yeah, so the idea of checks and balances, you put limits on everything, dictators only had their role for six months. Um, and now I'm going to put the screen back to screen sharing. So you don't want to watch me reading the notes. Does anyone want to say anything while I'm fiddling around with this? Hi. Say it. I just said hi. Hey, is that Evan? Hi, Evan. Yeah. I recognize your voice. How's everyone going at home? Good. Is everyone okay? Yeah. Yes. I'm just looking at everyone's faces. There's lots of smiles and half smiles. That's really nice. Well, I hope you are, guys. Hope we can get through this and, and be good people still at the end and mm -hmm. not be ashamed of anything we've done. Um, and, I mean, and we will. We will. As soon as we realise that's what we have to do, then we will. Okay. Uh, uh, so the plot against America, checks and balances, the estates here, yeah, the different estates. I think I mentioned the press is sometimes called the fifth estate. But the idea is you've got these separate organs that all look after each other. So you've got the executive body like the president or the prime minister. And then you've got the public service and then you've got the judiciary independent of them. Uh, and you've got uh, the police are hopefully separate to everyone. And you've got the uh, army is hopefully separate to everyone, and you've got the media hopefully separate to everyone, you've got academics annoying everyone in the background, criticizing and grumbling about things like that wonderful Norman Swan does. Um, so the idea is you've just got all these different voices and for the system to get stuffed, you'd have to actually corrupt and stuff five different voices and it's hard to do. Um, I, was, I remember when I was in Cambodia, someone was telling me, I didn't know the full story of the Khmer Rouge, but that the first thing he did was he 
he asked this is such a sad story. He said, we want to rebuild this country and make it fantastic. And I need all the great thinkers and all the teachers and all the, all the people who are good at, um, at, at the lawyers and the judges and the former leaders and police people, all these people that know about how to make a good country. I need you all to come into the city and tell us how to run the country. And then of course they all came in and just killed them. So it was a country that just lost its teachers and its lawyers and its doctors. In fact, he went around killing anyone with glasses on apparently because they were more likely to be intellectual. So he's just trying to silence all those other voices. Um, so yeah, all right. Um, uh, and leaders like leading, uh, yeah, like Dr. Strangelove, we saw at the end of Dr. Strangelove when they were planning how they would survive the Holocaust, lo and behold, they were all gonna be quite well off. The, the survival plan was sort of looking after them. And like Douglas Adams said, uh, uh, it, that when they go and find the ruler of the galaxy, the person who's actually running the galaxy, and they say, how did you get this job? And it turns out the number one criteria for getting the job of being the ruler of the whole galaxy is to not want to be the ruler of the whole galaxy. And I often wish we had that in politics, that you couldn't get elected unless you didn't want to be elected. And I think um, there have been some great leaders in history who have been like that. George Washington, for example, um, he only wanted to be in, uh, in power for a little while. And then once everything was okay, they kept asking, oh, come back, rule us again. He said, no, nah, it's too tempting. I'll stuff things up. You go and find someone else. You're on your own now. What a great guy. Um, uh, COVID-19, I think we talked about that. So I now wanted to talk about, um, when I went up to Byron Bay ages ago, I remember I was so happy, so nice. And we went to this stall by the beach and they were selling delicious ice creams. And I went up to the guy who was serving the ice creams and said, can I have that one and that one and that one? Can I have three different flavors in a cone? And he looked at me like I was an idiot and he said, don't speak to me. You've got to speak to the girl at the counter up there. I said, huh? And I went up to the counter at the other end, the cash register, like three feet away. There's just jammed in a tiny little trolley. And I said, um, I'd like those three flavors. And she says, okay. And she types them into a computer and then prints out a little receipt and hands it to me. And then I took a step to the side and handed the receipt to the guy. And he said, oh, okay. And then he made the ice cream and gave it to me. And I thought, what, what? Why, why are they doing that? What's the point of that? And it wasn't until I started studying security and thinking about command and control structures that I realized what was going on. Can anyone think why, why on earth, if you were the owner of that business, did you have two people doing that? Well, probably one person could have done that. So you don't get mates rates? So you don't get mates rates. Yeah, that's a good one. Was that Oliver? Yeah, yeah, well done. Yeah, more, keep going. That, that's that's part of it. Or just like you can't be serving your friend if yeah. you have to go and get your other friend to like, you have to be friends with everyone. Yeah, it's yeah. Fine. Yeah, yeah, that's right. To corrupt this system, you have to corrupt two people. Because I guess the person that ran the system didn't trust the backpack as he had running his ice cream store. And to make this break, you'd have to break two. And think about it. There's all sorts of different attacks and this stops most of them. One of them is the server... Um, now, one of them is the person who collects the money doesn't collect the right amount of money because there's no way of checking the amount of money being collected corresponds to the amount of ice cream going out, except at the end of the day, I guess you could weigh the van and see how much, or weigh the ice cream tubs and see how much has gone. But it wouldn't let you really pinpoint what had gone wrong, just that something had gone wrong. Uh, and probably you couldn't even do that easily because there's probably different prices for volumes, different volumes and things. It's really hard to actually compute what happened. Uh, so, yeah, basically I'd have to... I, I can't get mates rates. Also, the girl can't steal money from the till. Why can't she steal money from the till? Why can't she just collect the money, say, here's your ice cream and keep the money, slip it in a pocket? Because it's on record how many things were purchased. Yeah, it's on record because she has to produce this receipt to give to him in order for him to get the ice cream. And the receipt is produced by the system that produces record. So a record is forced to be kept of all the money she's put in. And I, the customer, will enforce that because I really want my ice cream. And as long as the other guy's not in cahoots with her, if they're in cahoots, then pff, you're stuffed. But as long as the other guy's not in cahoots with her, he's not gonna give the ice cream out without the thing. So it's just, yeah, that's really good. You might wanna think of all the other attacks you could carry out on the ice cream stall and see how many this, it protects you against. It protects you against most of them. Can anyone think of an attack it doesn't protect you against? The guy serving himself ice cream? 
the guy serving himself ice cream. Yes. Or I wasn't even thinking of that, but it's a, it's the same. It's a nicer version of what I was thinking. I think you pay for two, but he gives you six. You know, so if you've corrupted him, you record that a payment happened, but there's actually no way of knowing what he hands out corresponds to that payment. Anyway, this is a general idea of um, a principle known as double entry bookkeeping. The idea being, um, and this sort of revolutionized finance. So around the time that the Medici's in Italy, uh, like in the Renaissance time, businesses used to be just family businesses. So you wouldn't cheat because you're cheating your family or yourself. But what if you were a really big business and you had branches in other cities? Well, you get your uncle or your aunt or your cousin to run the branch and it's a big family and everyone trusts each other so it all works. Yeah, but what if you get really big? So big you run out of relatives you trust. Well, then you put strangers in that you sort of trust. Maybe you've worked with them and you've become friends with them. But can you do that? Well, we know. The answer is no. You can't even trust your relatives, but no one wants to admit that. Um, you can't trust anyone because anyone can become corrupt because insiders happen all the time and corruption happens all the time and people feather their own nest all the time. It's human nature. So how can you keep control on a business in another city that you don't even see? All, all that happens is maybe once a month they send you all the profits. Well, how do you know they're sending you the right amount of profits? So this very clever system called double entry bookkeeping was invented where essentially it's what we, uh, uh, the general term for all of these things we're talking about now is called dual control. You want to have essentially two things happening that aren't exactly lined up. So you'd have to fake or break both of them to break the system. So a dual, can you think, um, oh no, I'll talk a bit more about this first. So uh, the idea being uh, in double entry bookkeeping, you might want to read out about it. But actually it's funny, most people when they write about it, the accountants and people, they talk about how wonderful it is. And they talk, they talk about all sorts of details. It's very hard to find anyone that actually talks about it from a security point of view. They talk about, I don't know, it's really weird, but it's just very clearly a brilliant security mechanism. So if you can find a good book about it, years ago I did find a good book about it that blew me away. And recently I bought a couple of other books trying to find out more about double entry bookkeeping. And they just, they talk about how good it is and they're going on and on about it and talking about the history, but they're not talking about it in terms of a dual control system being good. They're just talking about, it in terms, I think they just love numbers. So uh, anyone that can find any more information about why it's good, that'd be great. But basically with double entry bookkeeping, and I've never done it, I've only read about it, is you keep two different books. Everything goes in both books and both books have to coincide or, coincide or reconcile. So you have to fake both books to fake something, or you'd have to change both books to change something. Now, hopefully the way the books are set up is either it's like uh, the ice cream stall, so it's in the interest of the customer that the books are right, like it was in my interest that I get the ice cream. So there's some sort of checking there, or you have different people doing the different books or something like that. Um, it's funny, these days we still do double entry bookkeeping, but it tends to all be done inside a single software package like mind your own business. And I can't help but think that sort of undermines a lot of the goodness of it because if you can corrupt the package, you can corrupt both books. I mean, what's the point of having it in two books if they're both vulnerable by the same person for the same thing? You know, maybe that's a useful way of seeing the information, but it's, you're losing your security mechanism. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Anything else about double entry bookkeeping? No, anyway, double entry bookkeeping, very interesting. I like the idea, have to corrupt two people. Oh yeah, I was gonna say with phones, I think we talked about that with authentication last week. Um, the the old, old idea of, ah, oh, yeah, maybe someone's hacked into their bank account, but they won't have access to their mobile phone in their pocket. So I'll send a SIM message, SIM, uh, an SMS message to the phone uh, and, and people have to prove they have the phone in order to respond to that. So it's like two different controls. Well, they call it two different factors in authentication. But you can see that's not really dual control anymore because if someone gets your phone, they get both the, both the factors. Um, okay, I think we're nearly there. Bookkeeping, ice cream. Oh, we've done it all, woo -hoo! Um, Now, the, uh, we're gonna have a little break and I'm gonna show you a fun movie. Uh, the thing I wanted to say about uh, dual control, other thing to say, the conclusion to the whole thing. Oh yeah. Um, no, this isn't the conclusion. It's just an interesting thing. Do you remember in the opening sequence we saw for uh, war games when they went into the bunker and they were told to launch missiles and all sorts of things like that? They went through quite a lot of elaborate physical security and protocols, protocol security to get in there. And I really advise everyone to watch that again uh, and just think about all the different elements that happened as they went in. Can anyone think of an example of dual control that happened in that whole scenario? when they were flicking it over to um, be like on internal operation, 
yeah. they um, had the one person reading the checklist and the person checking. Oh, say that again, Tom. I, no, I thought you were saying something else. So my ears would, I was hearing what I wanted to hear. Um, they were like closing off the base and there was one guy who was flicking all the switches to close off the base and the other guy was watching it and checking. Oh, yeah. And that's not the clip at the beginning. That's when we actually watched it in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. right. Sorry. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. Someone does something and someone else watches and checks that. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, yeah. And you'll have seen that too in Dr. Strangelove, that sequence in the cockpit. You know, people do something, someone calls it out, someone else checks it. Uh, in fact, uh, that's not dual control to stop corruption. That's dual control to stop errors. The idea being that two people are less likely to make an error than one person. Um, that's a really, really good uh, example. And I think we talked about that before, slightly before with errors in computers, that, uh, and I was talking about elections, that we make errors, but they tend to be random errors. And of course, the problem is if you've got a computer uh, and you say, ah, now we've got rid of errors. Well, you've got rid of all the random errors, but you've still got your systemic errors, and now you don't have the way of double checking and catching them. Um, so, uh, for example, in the old days when I was an actuary, that was so boring. And here's an example of how it would be boring. Sometimes I'd have to read, I'd, I'd have to actually manually uh, type in a whole lot of figures into, um, uh, we did it all on pen and paper, and then you do it on a calculator and you'd write the answers on pen and paper. And at the end, you'd have to enter it all into the computer to do something like that. And you had to get it right. And sometimes you were doing, you know, 20 digit calculations and you had to enter it correctly. So we had a rule that anything that got sent out to the client, two people had to sign off on it. So it had to be checked by, had, everything had to be done by one person and checked by another person. Um, and that's a sort of dual control for errors. Uh, and because, you know, there's little chance you'll both make the same errors. It's sort of why we like pair programming. If you think of pair programming, one of the reasons it's so powerful is it's like those shavers with the blades I've talked about before. Or that, you know, those the shavers, the ads for those, they show one blade gets past one shaver blade, one hair gets past one of the blades, but then the next blade picks up that hair. Has anyone seen those ads? Maybe they're from a long time ago. Yeah, Leary, you've seen them, but you're from a long time ago like me too. So, um, but anyway, I should find a picture of those ads because that's a great example. Um, so that's why we do pair programming. One of the reasons we do pair programming. And you'll notice it's the exact opposite of command and control. Of course, in command and control, you don't question. Uh, that, that actually is you know, the whole point of the thing. So, um, so what was I saying? Too many diversions. Uh, uh, yeah, you were saying people read. Oh, yeah. So we do these calculations when I was an actuary. And I had this way of checking. And I still do it with numbers if it's a critical number I'm typing in. So, for example, on my banking app, if I have to B pay someone or transfer money to another account, and it's in a system that I'm not confident, confident. is an error, I might get money back if I missed it. Has anyone ever done that? It's quite frightening. You type in the account number and you think, oh, I've got a digit wrong. I've just sent all that money, all 52 cents, I've sent to the wrong person and I'll never get it back. So, I want to make sure I've typed the account number incorrectly. How do I check that? Well, I always get, or I try to get one of my daughters to read the number back and I check. But I do the trick we used to do when we were actuaries, which is um, she reads the number out backwards. So I type it in forwards and then when we're checking, we read it backwards. Because I think you can sometimes make the same error when you read a number, the doubles and triples or similar runs lead to errors. But if you read something backwards, you're less, so I can even check myself by doing something backwards because I'm less likely to make the same error. Whereas if I've said it once in my head, that sing song list of all the numbers, the next time I'm reading it out, I'm probably doing the same sing song and I'm probably remembering what I said part time and my eyes are seeing what I'm remembering and singing in my head. A bit like I did when Tom made his, said his thing. I, was, I thought he was saying what I wanted him to say. And he was saying something else and it took quite a while for me to realize because I was projecting my words onto him. So yeah, reading it backwards is a good way of being slightly independent with yourself, but getting someone else to do it even better. Um, and also when I'm proofreading uh, documents, so for example, there's a legal contract and I have to check that I've got an identical copy that someone else has, um, uh, maybe with their handwritten or something. I don't know why we do that, but it has happened sometimes. So how I always check the two copies are the same is one person reads and one person checks, but we read the words backwards. Because again, if you're reading backwards, all the semantic meanings lost and it's just a series of words and you can check the words. Whereas if you're reading forwards, you start anticipating what's gonna come next, you start seeing what's there, you don't notice typos and things because you're seeing what you expect. So as much as possible, try and um, do checking that's independent. Now Tom said that people, one person was doing it, one person was checking. In airplanes, and we'll talk about this later on, and disasters and accidents, uh, 
for safety, people have invented checklists. And there's an, there's an almost dual control idea with a checklist, which is in order to make something safe, go through this list and there's a checklist for every eventuality. And often during a crash or if there's some problem with um, a plane or, or a crisis, pilots will quickly start going through the checklist of things they've got to do. Someone's pre-computed all the steps they're supposed to do. And the idea is, um, so you read the step and then you carry it out. And you often read the words as you're carrying them out. And also, um, uh, the, at the time you're executing, it might not be possible to dual control it, but um, maybe when the checklist is produced, it was dual control in that maybe two or three sensible people looked at the checklist to see if you're overlooking or omitting things before it was made and printed out. So you're just moving the checking in time, the dual control in time. So checklists are in a way an example of that. So Tom's right. The other one I was thinking of from the movie though is, um, when they in the opening sequence, Tom, when they were turning the two keys, you had to have two people turning the key in order to enable the system. And the keys were placed far enough apart that one person couldn't reach to both. Um, so that was an example of dual control. You need to have two people agreeing to watch. All right. Whew. That was very long. Um, let me just looking through my notes. Is there anything else I really wanted to say there? No. All right. Can I show you this video now? Do you want to see a video? Or do you want to get up and move around? What do you want to do? Lillian, what do you want to do? Probably move around. <laughs> okay, everyone move around a little bit. I'm going to move around too. And uh, I'll meet you back here in, what, like uh, four minutes? Does that sound good? Get some exercise. Good. Yep, yep. Uh, you can play the video while we move around. Oh, yeah, I could. What do you think of that, Lillian? Sounds good. All right, I'll play the video. It's a five-minute video. That's perfect. Uh, let me just work out how to do it. Am I sharing the screen already? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were seeing me. You're seeing the screen. It's probably nicer to see the screen, isn't it? You can see both, actually. How do you see both? What are you doing? You I don't know. Little... Yeah, your your um, photo comes up as like a little thing at the top of the screen. And there are configuration options. Ah, yeah. I think a more competent lecturer would know about all that, wouldn't you think, Tom? <laughs> I... I I, I try not to make any comments about my lecturers, but I think you're a very confident lecturer. Oh, that was very nice. Uh, you know, it's funny, you were saying then, I know you're saying I was completely hopeless, but my ears were hearing what I wanted to hear yet again. All right, let me play this video. I really love this video. Uh, and please, it has, I can't remember it has bad language. It's potentially slightly offensive. I just want everyone to know this is just entirely satirical. I think I've preloaded it already. Part of being, what are you doing? Can you hear it? Yeah. Don't forget to move around. <laughs> Maybe dance. We should act it out.
It's a bit more violent than I remembered. Terrorize this. All right, let's make this interesting. Kia! seen in Tim America World Police. Has anyone already seen it? Yeah, yeah, Jane. It's awesome. Uh, so this is our next topic, which is assets. So the idea being in security, we're protecting stuff. What are we protecting? We're protecting our assets. What are our assets? You'd be surprised how many times people forget to ask that question. They just jump in and start protecting. Let's just protect, 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 protect. But actually you've got to work it out. What is it you're trying to protect? What are your assets? So we're now going to talk about just briefly how you might go about doing that. And mainly the point of this is to say, don't forget to work out what your assets are. Don't forget to work out what you're trying to protect. Um, so in this, um, in this uh, clip here, what we see is um, they are trying to stop some terrorists, which is, of course, a good thing to do. Uh, and they destroy the Louvre and the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower. And that's a pity. So the question is, yeah, sacrifices have to be made. <laughs> I mean, this is part of the thing I was talking about before, that some, we have this thing that we just are good at focusing on one thing at a time, but actually, although that's easy and convenient and makes really good rhetoric, um, the part of the trick I've found about being an adult is trying to juggle a whole lot of balance, not juggle, balance a whole lot of different competing things. And there's never a perfect solution, even though in movies there always is. Um, and you just have to be really careful then in whatever you do to solve a problem that you make sure because you'll never solve it perfectly and you'll create new problems when you try and solve it. So you just sort of got to make sure that you do the best you can. And you can't do the best you can by just going with your gut instinct because your gut instinct is going to be wrong. You're going to pick one thing. We call it the movie hypothesis. You'll pick one thing on that's, and you'll try and stop that one thing. So like a Hollywood movie, um, it's only about one thing. There's only one thing they've got to carry out. All the other things are important. Uh, and the one thing's normally big and scary and obvious and standing on its own. But actually, life, you've got to balance all these hundreds of different things. And my favourite movies often are ones where um, 
you know, someone achieves some goal they set out to do at the beginning, but you sort of wistfully realize partway through that they've lost something else that's equally important or something. So what we were seeing in that Team America clip here was exactly that, that, okay, we've got to stop terrorism because terrorism is bad. Why is terrorism bad? Probably not from the number of people, people it kills because we've talked about that before. The number of people killed by road accidents or smoking is much worse, but we still give lots of money to tobacco companies and we like them and normal human beings go and work in them. Uh, even though they're killing more people than terrorists, um, and we don't try and kill them. Uh, so, you know, lots of bad things happen in the world. Probably the bad thing about terrorism, the thing that makes it so pervasive, is it gets in our mind. It causes terror. It makes everyone unhappy. And um, that has this effect of focusing our attention. And then once we focus our attention on something, we want to get rid of it. So it is like the shiny, distracting object that we can't help but look at. And terror in society is no good. I mean, part of society is just living a happy life and feeling safe. Feeling safe is probably even more important than being safe. And terrorism corrodes and attacks that. So it is, you know, it is attacking a really important asset we have, our sense of safety. Uh, uh, from the US Empire, to Al-Qaeda only exists because... I can only see fragments of the comments. They're so elusive. They're a bit like haikus. I'll read the full comments later on. Um, and next week I'll work out how to have comments and pictures. Uh, um, so, yeah, it is tricky. Um, so the question is, is, there's this famous line, be careful what you wish for. I think probably everyone knows that that you wish for something and you could get it. And it's in all cultures and mythologies and stories and fables and probably religions as well. This idea that you really wish for something and then you get it and you realize to get it, you've, you've lost something that's more important. Like um, Joni, that Joni Mitchell song, uh, Paved Paradise, but up a parking lot, the big yellow taxi song. You know, you really want a parking lot, but at the end you, you've lost paradise. Or you really want, um, you know, you, you, you want to achieve, you want a lot of my, people I know really wanted to become wealthy. That was the shiny object that attracted their attention and they've managed to optimize and succeed and do that. And they have become very wealthy. Um, but along the way, uh, I just think they might've lost a lot of happiness in their lives uh, and, and probably they picked the wrong thing to optimize. So anyway, that's the general uh, discussion around assets. Now let's just look at assets. Let me just kill Team America World Police uh, and go back to the lecture notes and Make sure that I'm not, that you can see them. Maybe I should share them again. Here we go. All right, and here's my five slides. So we've got to come up, we've got to work out what the assets are and um, that what the things are you're trying to protect. Now, you're security people, so you probably know the first question you should ask when you're faced with a difficult question like this, like this isn't something you can stick into a formula and you get the right answer. This is asking a question where the, it leaves the computer and enters the real world, which is as a human being or as an organization or as a company or a university or whatever, what's important to you? And so I can, obviously you're the only one that can answer that and your company is the only one that can answer that. Um, but as a security person, we should think, how can this process fail? What could go wrong with this if we sit down to work our assets out? And the most obvious failure, and it does happen all the time, is people overlook large, important things and don't notice it till later on. And probably I did that when I was preparing for the corona withdrawal. I rushed around getting lots of things. Um, and then now I'm here and we've withdrawn. Uh, I keep thinking, oh, I forgot. Oh, I didn't think of. And there's whole categories of things I didn't even think of. Um, so uh, I think risk is you will forget a whole category of assets. You won't notice that until you lose it, um, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, so, uh, how, so I think the biggest risk is you just won't identify the assets you should be protecting. So let's look at mechanisms for identifying all the assets. And these are just rules of thumb from me and they're not guaranteed to work, but um, they're better than nothing. They're like a checklist. But I don't, what I don't want you to do, because you could, in some courses, um, when they teach assets, they just give you a checklist of things to do, of how to find all your assets. And you could go through that checklist, think you found all the assets, think, done, move on. But hopefully in this course, we never think, done, move on, because we always know we're not done. So this is just a starting point to make sure you don't forget some stuff, but it's not the ending point. So how would you find all the assets? 
Well, if I was trying to find all the assets, I would ask all the people in the organization, as many as I could, because again, dual control, or um, another word for that, I guess is defense in depth. Uh, just try and have lots of eyes looking at it and that I might forget something, but there's a chance, there's a chance that me and person B might forget it and A, B and C might forget it. So that's good. Also different people in different parts of the organization will have a different view on what the organization does and what's important to it. And you might just take a whole lot of things for granted and not realize there's all these important assets there that need to be protected. So involve as many people as possible. If it was just a couple of execs or security people that gets together in a little locked room by themselves, not connected to reality and comes up with a list of what's important, you've probably overlooked a whole lot of really important things. So get out there and ask everyone inside. Multiple pairs of eyes. Work out a plan. So just asking people, um, uh, uh, what are the assets? Although in theory, it sounds good. In practice, most people will stare at you blankly or just tell you what they think you want to know. Uh, so actually have a strategy to get the information from people that's likely to work. I suggest your strategy should involve some sort of feedback. So you get a list and you show it to other, show it to people so they can constantly comment on it. Because often people, when they see things, they can criticize them and spot problems in it. But given a blank sheet of paper, they won't necessarily get everything right. Um, so do work out some sort of plan. I would say, oh, what we're going to do is we're going to consult with people for three weeks and we go, oh, Gloria, what are you doing? Gloria, that's a very nice tummy there. Um, so uh, I talk to a whole lot of people. Uh, I'd say we're going to consult for three weeks. Then we're going to produce an interim plan and we're going to circulate that. And then I want you to check with all your customers and your clients on that. And there'll be two weeks of this and then blah, 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 blah. But just somehow actually work out this long process and tell everyone what, what you're going to be doing um, and don't just invent it as you go. Work out some sort of checklist of doing it. Um, then when you've done it and you're really feeling smug and you think, ah, oh, I've worked out all the assets of our organization that I have to protect. Like for example, I think I asked in the exam one year, you're the newly appointed CSO, Chief Security Officer for UNSW. Uh, you've got a budget of X. What are you going to spend it on? So um, good answers versus bad answers. Bad answers. Oh, here are my random first thoughts that I thought of. I think uh, coronavirus and smallpox or this shiny object over here. Uh, and it doesn't matter how well they explore coronavirus, smallpox or the shiny object over there. They're just missing so many things. So uh, the good answers did this. They sat down and articulated what all the assets were that they were trying to protect. I, I didn't say the word asset in the question. I just said, what are you going to do? You've got a budget. How are you going to do it? And it was up to them to realize, oh, this is a question where I need to actually work out what I've got to protect. And they found all sorts of really interesting assets. And interestingly, UNSW itself has gone through an asset um, strategy recently, trying to identify all its assets. And um, they, they actually did it quite well and did involve and consult with lots of people and then produce lists and show them to other people and things and so on. So they're sort of doing it quite well. Um, but you can imagine, what are the assets of a uni? What do you guys think? What are the assets you'd have to protect? Why doesn't everyone take one minute to write a list of as many? Now, don't even call them out just yet, though. Well done, whoever did. Who was it? Was it Michael? No, someone? No, it was Tom. Tom. Oh, well done, Tom. Yeah, everyone just grab a piece of paper and write down five things. See how you go. Imagine it's an exam question. What are five things you want to protect in the uni? There'll be a hundred, so just pick five important ones. Twenty more seconds. Clifford, that's an awesome picture. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, look, a really interesting thing. I could see your faces, those who've got the cameras turned on while you were thinking. Uh, and a friend of mine told me about this, and it seems to be quite true, that 
everyone has a characteristic thing they do with their eyes when they're thinking, like when your, your brain goes inside itself and you sort of turn off everything. And whether the eye, apparently, and I don't know if this is true, um, whether your eyes goes to the left or the right or up or down tells, it, tells something about your brain. He was saying, oh, yeah, it tells you if you're left brain or right brain or something. I don't know if it's true, but I can certainly notice that Tom, your eyes go in a completely different direction to Gloria's partner who's now Michael Bartman. Sorry. To be fair, that's also because I'm looking at a monitor that's next to my screen. Oh, curses. curses. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Uh, were you looking at the monitor when you were thinking of it? Uh, yes, I was. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Except your eyes. I was writing down. Where's the monitor? Here. Ah, but your eyes are going the other way. Is it not possible? You think you were looking at the monitor the whole time? I and mean, maybe for some of it, I, I wasn't. Maybe I was looking back here. I don't know. But okay. um, All right. Yeah. Uh, I could easily be wrong because, you know, we just see what we want to see. So, Tom, what we, what's one of yours? Yeah. Well, yeah, like, like I said, the, the physical buildings is one. The physical buildings is one. That's the same one. Good. Yeah, the physical buildings. With a lot of money, a lot of your money goes into building those buildings. Mahima. Breathing in the This is my ear. What do you reckon? I hear my ear. Um, I said, like, intellectual property. Yeah, like, that's a really good one. Well done. Um, yeah, there's lots of ideas at the uni. Someone else want to say something? Money. Money. Yeah, the uni has a bank account. So there are chemicals in there. Say again. Sorry, I was going to say, is there chemicals like in like the science building or the chemistry lab? Oh, yeah. Are there like Potentially acids hazardous that you chemicals tell? that could be... Yeah. Maybe they have restrictions on getting them. Oh, yeah. Or you can do bad things with them or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good point. I've never heard that one before. That's a really good one. Communication channels in general? Yeah. The uni's ability. The uni is sort of an organism that only exists when it's moving. Uh, uh, you know, it has a life independent of the buildings. And so if it lost its ability to communicate, that would be very disruptive. Yeah. Is the reputation as well? Yeah, reputation is huge. I reckon my top three would be reputation, but it wouldn't be number one, though I put one finger up. Um, my, the number one would be uh, the humans on campus, staff and students, the safety of the staff and students. Um, and number two would probably be its reputation. And number three would be financial things like money and, and, and buildings and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, it's easy to forget the humans, but an attack where you keep all your money but lose the humans or damage any humans is probably not worth it. I would think the uni would think. Would you would you say in a situation like now where you've got um, everyone sort of working off of campus or majority of people working off of campus, then because you said humans on campus, as in would would you still need to protect them in that case as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The um, I, I don't know if they need to protect them, but they need to notice it's an asset. Mm. So what they end up deciding to protect depends on the cost of that protection and the impact that has on the risk. So if you could spend a ridiculous amount of money and just change the risk slightly, it's probably not a good use of money. But you need to know your very top asset is your, your students. So we should be getting everyone to work safely. We should be encouraging people to do the right thing, all of that sort of stuff. And also our reputation is so important. If people started thinking you know, we were a joke and not scholarly and not academic or something like that. That would be quite um, a disaster. Uh, so, uh, so I would think for most organisations, protecting their people is probably absolutely important to include um, uh, and their reputation and then their financial assets, then interesting side assets people are talking about. Uh, um, the, so here are just some random examples. Uh, I think I told you this story already, didn't I? I was walking down the street, someone said, I'll stick this syringe in your neck unless you give me your wallet. Did I tell you this? I think I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and I didn't give them the wallet and I got the syringe stuck in my neck. Uh, and afterwards I thought, well, I protected the wallet asset. I just got to protect my life asset. And at the end of the day, probably that was not a sensible choice. Did I tell you the car do doorbell story? 
My friend who has this very expensive car, used to park it in Glebe all the time. People would break into it all the time. He thought it was drug addicts trying to get stuff that smash the car up and take stuff out. And he got so cross and annoyed that people were breaking into his car all the time that he wanted to put an alarm on. He's a very clever man. So what he did was he, but he's also very stingy. So he just got a, a remote doorbell um, that goes ding dong when you push the button and he flipped the switch around. So it ding donged when you release the button. I guess he had to probably swap the type of switch. Uh, and then he just put that, put that switch in the car uh, inside the door. So when the door was shut, I pushed the switch in. So as soon as someone opened the car, I went ding dong. If someone opened the car door inside his house, he put the thing inside his house because he parked outside his house. And he was talking about how clever it was. And I was thinking, no, no, no. Because um, what are you going to do when the ding dong goes off? You're going to go outside and have a fight with drug addicts. That's, you know, might protect your car. But the, the smartest person I know for protecting cars, um, the people used to smash the car window to reach in to look for loose change. Um, uh, he had one of those little triangle windows at the front. They don't have them anymore on cars now, but there used to be this little sort of side window by the driver that was a little triangular shape and you could punch through it quite easily. So people would smash it and then just grab into the glove box and take whatever was in there. And he uh, protected that by leaving his window open. <laughs> he said, I don't care if they take what's out of the glove box. The real I said I'm trying to protect here is my window because uh, it would cost me 300 bucks to replace each time. So he'd just leave his window open as it was parked at night. Uh, uh, the share registry, yeah, we've gone to an electronic share registry, no more paper trails. Um, you might want to think about what assets they're trying to protect and what the risks are of having a share registry go online. Coca-Cola, what are they trying to protect? Their recipes. Well, yeah, you'd think it was their recipe. Uh, that's part of this very, very clever thing they've done. Apparently the recipe is widely known to lots of people and you could reverse engineer it from the ingredients they buy and there's all these side channel leakages and so on and so on. But you know, the myth is that it's locked in a safe and, 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 and only one person has a combination and all that sort of stuff. But they do that to build, to give value to the recipe. So you think, oh, it's special and secret must be really good. Um, I think um, they've done, they've collected, um, uh, those fMRI machines to people's brains and got them to drink Coca-Cola and drink Pepsi and look at how their brain lights up differently. And when you drink Coke, one part of your brain lights up really excitedly. And when you drink Pepsi, another part does. And you probably know the story that if you ever do a blind test on people and they don't know if they're drinking Coke or, or Pepsi, they always prefer, prefer Pepsi. It tastes nicer. But if they know what one they're drinking, they always prefer Coke. Um, and it turns out that... Um, this center of your brain that lit up, it's associated with the pleasure center when you drink Coke, would also light up if you're drinking Pepsi and someone told you it was Coke. So it's the, essentially the brand. Your, your brain is just programmed to respond to that brand because of all their marketing. So their brand is everything. So um, an attack on them where they looked like dicks or they didn't look cool, uh, you know, that, that would be a really effective attack. So that's what they're trying to protect. Um, an attack on parliament. Yeah, what are the assets of parliament? Uh, okay, let's not talk about that anymore. Uh, so how do you value the assets? Um, I reckon at least have this checklist to go down, but you probably want to add to the checklist and come up with your own ones and you can search online and certainly there's lots of standards of ways that people suggest that you should go around finding assets and it's called enumerating the assets. So you've got tangible assets. You've got intangible assets. Right. You've got um, uh, uh, what have we got here? Employee morale and security, customer information, company secrets, availability of services. That's the sort of communication channel someone's talking about. Just your availability is really important. Uh, then uh, there's psychological and emotional costs that uh, you will incur if things go wrong. Uh, the point I wanted to say was just because it's really difficult to value intangible assets, that doesn't mean don't do it. They're probably your most important assets. Uh, you just gotta do the best you can. It's really hard and you'll probably get the number wrong, but you should still try. Um, and yes, I went to those, I went to those, I went to those. Oh, can you read all this? How would you assess the value of a park? Here's something. How would you work out the value of a Picasso painting? What if it wasn't a Picasso painting? It was the same painting, but it was painted by someone else. 
it's very interesting to work out how things are valued. Uh, the science of valuing things is really, um, it's arcane. There's at least three different methods that are all equally plausible we use to assign monetary values to things. One is how much someone else will pay for it. So that's simple and you can measure that. If someone will give you $100 for it, it's gotta be worth $100. Um, one is how much you paid for it, like the cost basis. And often people say, oh, don't damage this. It's worth 700 bucks. And I think, mm, actually, no, it cost you 700 bucks. <laughs> it's not necessarily worth 700 bucks. Um, uh, uh, one is um, how much it would cost you to replace it. Uh, and the, these are off. And one is if it generates income for you, the present value of all the future income flows that it's going to give to you. And these methods all give you different numbers. And maybe you can arbitrage between them. Certainly, if the income stream you can get from it in the future uh, is a higher value than what other people are prepared to buy or sell it at, it's worth buying. But, um, oh, Tom, you want control of my screen. Why do you want that? I was just, I saw a button there and I was curious what would happen if I, um, if I, if I did it. All right, I'm giving you control of my screen. I, I want you to... Let me just find the terminal and RMRF. Uh, That's really concerning. What's that? Actually, I can't. Run the lecture, can't. Tom. Sorry? Don't run the lecture. I'm not going to run the lecture. That seems like a really bad idea. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But that's, that's yeah. fun. Anyway. Look, I like you clicking on buttons. That's a good thing to do. Just I'll don't give you back remote control. Yeah. There you go. You have control again because that seems like a bad idea to sort of distract yeah. from halfway through the lecture. I think I set up the preferences to be quite lenient to let people do things. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, think about, uh, and there's a whole lot of interesting stuff on art fraud. So we're talking about physical security recently. There's been a couple of art frauds really recently too. Um, uh, in fact, a whole lot of art that's out there now is believed to have been fake. Uh, and it's really hard to know how to value that. So anyway, think about valuing things. I just want to point out that it's a difficult thing to do, but you've bloody got to do it because at the end of the day, you've got a small budget and you've got to spend it. Don't spend it on a gut feeling or a gut instinct. Do some sort of rational calculation and think, I've got to protect that, but I've also got to protect this. And I can't forget, this is still worth something. And then allocate how much you put on protecting them all based on the risk and how much you got. Uh, and how are we going for time? Oh, we're nearly there. Okay. And then hashes. We did talk about hashes before. Um, I was just going to do a tiny bit of hash revision. Do you want to do some hash revision or you want to just stop? What do you reckon? Yeah, keep going. Hash. All right. Yeah. We'll, just, we'll just do it for a few more minutes and then we'll have our party. Um, so here's some words that I've already sort of said to you already. Um, but the, um, in these notes here, I'm giving the terminology that I said in the other lecture because I couldn't work out how to write things. So the hash of X, if you've got a message, X, and you want to hash it, we call the hash H of X. So H of X equals H of X dash here. What that's meaning is the hash of one message called X is the same as the hash of another message called X dash or X prime. Uh, so that's uh, second pre-image resistance. Uh, but da, 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 da. I think that's just explaining. Here's the interesting points that we haven't really talked about. All right, the birthday attack. I don't think I talked about the birthday attack, did I? All right. I think I will just talk about the birthday attack now. Uh, I'm going to make Schneier's point first, Bruce Schneier, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the birthday attack, and then we're done. Schneier says, um, basically, you can... A hash should behave like a random function. So you stick, you put a message in, you should get something out that looks random. And you put a different message in, you should get a different hash coming out. And it's, there shouldn't look like there's any link between the message and the hash. It should just be completely random or look completely random. Uh, the question of randomness is really interesting, by the way. That's one of my obsessions. Because, of course, nothing's ever random. Uh, we, uh, in computing, we just talk about pseudo-random, things that look random. Um, and then you spend all your time trying to distinguish them from really random. Uh, but uh, we can talk about randomness another time, and we should, because it's so interesting. But um, the idea is if I can prove that a hash function isn't random or find some non-randomness to it, then I've essentially broken it. When we break, breaking a function, breaking a cryptographic function means 
you should stop using it. it means it's weak now. Uh, breaking a um, function, like either an encryption function or a hashing function, technically, we say something's broken when you can do something with it faster than you could brute force it. So we know all or most encryption algorithms can be brute forced. We haven't talked about one one time pads yet, which can't. And don't let please don't let me forget to talk about one time pads. They're so beautiful. But most encryption algorithms can be brute forced. You either brute force the key or you brute force all possible plain text messages to see which corresponds to the encryption the encrypted message. Um, so if it takes um, if it if there's um, two to the hundred possible keys. Oh, yeah, let's say two to the hundred possible keys, then the amount of work to brute force it on average, if you're brute forcing over all possible keys, would be two to the 99, because remember that's half of two to the hundred, because you've got one less doubling, so it's half the size. Um, uh, because on average you find it halfway through. And if that half thing didn't make sense, by the way, just remember that old funny riddle that we used to ask kindergarten or primary school kids. I've got a lily pond and I've got one lily on it. And every day, each lily splits into two lilies. In, in um, one month, the whole pond is covered. How long, how many days did it take till it was half covered? Too hard. You think it's too hard, but you'll kick yourself. I know it. I know. One final day. Oh, you didn't think it was hard. You were teasing me. Yeah. It's one, one day less, the day before, because it's doubling every day. So the day before, it was just half full. So if you just take one day off, that's half the size. If you double every day, that's exponential growth. So if you, two to the something is exponential. So two to the 100, half of that is two to the 99. Just take one off, one lot of two off. So yeah, on average, you'd, so we'd say that you had broken... A, 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 a cipher, if you, which you could brute force in a hundred bits of work. So on average, two to the ninety-nine. If you can work out a way of decrypting the message that takes two less than two to the ninety-nine bits of work on average, say that cipher is broken. Now notice, even if you only work out a way of it taking two to the ninety-eight, which is still a ridiculously big number. So it still takes two to the 98 bits of work. It's still better than brute force. So it's broken. So we stop, we want to stop using it then. It seems strict, but because once it's broken a little bit, it just tells you the whole thing's brittle and fragile and falling to pieces. Oh, uh, brittle and fragile reminds me, remember at the beginning I said when we were talking about systems, the properties we want them to have, what makes them prone to error? What makes them prone to catastrophe? What makes them prone to disaster? What makes them prone to attack? And I gave you two of the properties and that was um, coherence and um, uh, uh, coupling. So I think one thing we're seeing now with the whole Corona thing is an example of coupling. We have a tightly coupled system. So one thing going causes this ripple on effect. So you're probably noticing that with the supply chain now, if you lose, um, uh, well, you lose airplane travel, then suddenly uh, it has this ripple on effect and suddenly all these other things are affected. And you probably started to notice as you try to disentangle things. Oh, if that stopped working, that means this stops working. And Australia no longer manufactures its own cars. We just import them from other countries. So if we're not getting stuff from other countries, we're not going to get cars anymore. We, we, we've coupled ourselves to other countries. Um, and all the other things we don't manufacture anymore, we're not going to get. Uh, so uh, that's an example of we had a tightly coupled system. And we all know tightly coupled systems, when they work well, who cares? Uh, doesn't matter if they're coupled or not. Uh, but if they if something goes wrong, then you get a chain reaction. The, the coupling leads to a magnification of the impact. And I think the whole world is partly coupled at the moment. We're seeing examples of that. Oh, someone's drawing all over it. Love heart. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Who's doing that? What's your name? There are like four people doing it. That's fantastic. Everyone should do it. Graffiti over it. It's so beautiful. I hope people are taking photos of this. If I scroll up, is that going to ruin it? No, that's okay. This is like the place. Did you ever see the place, Richard? No, I didn't. Should I see the place? It was, um, it was like this thing on Reddit where you could post, you could basically put a pixel down on a shared screen, yeah, yeah, but yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. could do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We did that in uh, 2011. I let students get pixels in the course logo. Uh, every time you did something good, you got a pixel. 
And then people started collaborating. And by getting a pixel means they could control the color of the pixel that was on the course logo that was on every page. And then, um, so people started essentially graffitiing on the course logo. Um, and then people started colluding with other people and all the high school students doing HS1917 colluded and combined their points and changed the name of the course to be high school computing uh, by scribbling all over it. It was very exciting. Um, and then we were also making lots of fun about Denmark and a lot of people colluded and bought red and white pixels and were drawing Denmark flags here. Yes, the place, fantastic. I didn't know that's what it was called. It was very funny. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, I think I talked enough about that. Oh no, the birthday attack was what I was gonna say. So here's how the birthday attack, was. oh, the point I was trying to make then, let me just finish it because I can't remember if I did. It's broken even if in practice, it doesn't look like it's broken. It's broken even if you can break it slightly faster than brute force, even if it's still infeasible to break it, you don't like it, because now we're worried. We think, hmm, that you've found one problem suggests there's 50 more that we haven't found. So walk away. And I was gonna talk about the birthday attack. We've only got seconds left or negative seconds left. So uh, here's what I'm gonna say about it. It's based on something called the birthday paradox. The only paradox about the birthday paradox is it involves the word paradox because it's not a paradox. I cannot understand why it's called that. And the birthday paradox might be something you've done at school with a teacher where everyone goes around the room saying what their birthday is. And I sometimes do it in the course. And I'm really ashamed to say that sometimes people say their real birthday. So please never do that if someone asks you to illustrate the birthday paradox with real birthdays. They're just trying to trick you to get your birthday because we want all your money. So, uh, the idea is you ask the first person what their birthday is and you ask the next one and you ask the next one and you ask the next one. And after a ridiculously short period of time, you find two people with the same birthday. Someone suddenly says, my birthday is this. And you go, but that's the same as Brian's birthday. Uh, and it happens so quickly. Uh, and that's called the birthday paradox. I don't know why people call it that. The paradox is it happens much faster than you expect. Naively, sometimes people think, well, surely it would take hundreds of birthdays until you got a match. But it would take hundreds of birthdays until you got a match with a particular birthday. So I'd have to ask on average um, half of 365, what's that, 180-ish, 182. I'd, on average, I'd have to ask 182 people their birthday before I found someone who had the same birthday as me. So that would take a very large number of people to ask. But I have to ask many less people to find just a pair of them, any old random pair that have the same birthday. Because after you've asked six people, when you ask the seventh person, there's six birthdays they could give that would find a match. And once you've asked 10 people, the 11th person, there's 10 birthdays they could say which would give them a match. So the chance of a match increases quite quickly, or well, linearly, but increases as you go from person, as you add more and more people. So here's what you need to know about the birthday paradox. There's only one important thing to know about it. It's probably the only piece of maths you need to know in the course. There's only a double. If you've got N people, Sorry, if you've got N possible birthdays, so N for the real birthday paradox is 365, it takes on average the square root of N people to ask until you get a collision, until you get to the same thing. So if we lived on a planet that had a, a year that was a thousand days long, so there was a thousand possible birthdays, it would take the square root of a thousand people on average to ask before, well not people, aliens on the planet, that you'd have to ask before you hit a match. And if there are only 100 birthdays in a year, you'd only have to ask 10 people and on average you'd hit a match. So it's the square root. And why do we care about that? Because if we think of a hash function as a random function, like tossing a coin every time, then the number of possible hash values is this, the number of birthdays there are. So if you've got a 100 bit hash value, there's two to the 100 possible hash values. So if you've got a 100 bit hash value, and you just hashed messages randomly, how long before you found two messages in that group that had the same hash? So you hit a collision, like the birthday collision. How many messages would you have to hash till you found a collision? If you've got two to the hundred possible hashes. And the answer is, two to the, 50. the square root of two to the hundred people. You'd have to do the square root of two to the hundred hashes. And how do you find the square root? If you've got powers, you know how to halve, you just subtract one. Halving two to the hundred is two to the 99. But what's the square root of two to the hundred? Does someone want to say? It's two to the 50. 
So if you've got a hash, it's a hundred bit hash, someone can find a collision in that hash, carry out a collision attack, only doing two to the 50 bits of work. Well, only trying two to the 50 hashes. Now, you might want to sit down and work out how long it would take to, to do two to the 50 bits of work, but I'm pretty sure you know straight away that's a feasible amount of work. So if your hash is only 100 long, people in a feasible amount of time can find collisions. They can't necessarily find a pre-image, but they can find a collision. All right, I think that's all I wanted to say, and I have gone over by five minutes. So um, I'm really sorry. Stolen five minutes of your life. I Goodbye, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. We're going to start the party in a second or two. Um, but if, I, if you're not hanging around for the party, good luck to you all. I look forward to seeing you on Monday. Um, and oh, oh, and here's an announcement the uni's about to send out. I don't know if I have yet. Apparently, all courses are going to switch to be marked as just pass fail. Have you got an announcement saying that yet? Apparently, oh, not for the whole uni. Sorry, Liri is looking like she's swallowed a frog because uh, she's in law. No, in engineering. Uh, so apparently, it could be just gossip. It could exactly. be like a Donald Trump tweet. But apparently, this course is going to have to just issue a pass-fail mark. So that's what we'll do. But I'll tell you what, I'll still work out a merit list or something of the top people. And I'll still work out numbers if anyone wants them. Um, but uh, I don't An know. email will be going out about this letter. I presume. Yeah, I assume so. Yeah, this isn't an official announcement from me. This is just an official passing on of gossip. Um, but I've got to say, just think about how it will affect the course. I think it should just relax you because it means everyone's going to pass. I don't know. When does anyone ever fail this course? No one ever does. So you could just stop turning up and doing any work whatsoever and you're still fine. So hopefully it makes it clear in your mind now, why the heck am I doing this course? What do I want to get out of the course? Why am I here? Hopefully you want to learn awesome stuff and become awesome. So you'll put a lot of effort into the course trying to understand it all. But and develop awesome skills, but um, you don't have to do it because someone's bullying you with marks, just do it because you want to. If you don't want to, don't do it, but I hope you do, because it is fun. All right, so we're gonna have a party in a second. We're gonna see um, um, the, uh, the Spotless Mind film. Uh, Lyria, have you ever seen that film? No, you haven't? Oh, wow, maybe people haven't seen it. It's quite an old film. It's an awesome film, so I hope to watch it together. The links for doing it are on the announcement I sent around before. Let's hope they all work. If they don't, I'll post another announcement on Open Learning when I notice no one turns up. And we'll, it'll take us a minute or two to do it. Um, but anyway, lovely to see you all, and I look forward to seeing you all on, on Monday. Bye, everyone. Oh, look at that. You scribbled over everything. That is, that's my favorite screen ever. I'm going to take a screenshot of that. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. See you, everyone. I'll leave the camera on in case you're leaving slowly. Don't feel you have to go to home. While I try and work out how to take a screenshot. There's a save button at the top. Oh, is there? But well, I, at least I, on, for me, I can see a save button. Oh, okay. When you, it, when you click on annotate, it brings up like the options to... I don't get the option to annotate. You guys get, oh, I think I just did it. I got it. Oh, <laughs> so good. Thank you, everyone. And love hearts. That's so good. Love hearts back from me to you. And a Homer, someone drew Homer Simpson. That's fantastic. And actually, I've set the movie up on the other laptop just over here. So I'm just going to walk off screen for a second and actually click go over here. So you're not connected to the internet. Oh, okay. Steal the internet pack. There we go. Ah. Plug it in. Yeah. Netflix party. All right. Can people see it? Has anyone come here? Someone post a note if you're here already. I've said starting at 7 p.m. Chat room. I can't see any other notes. I hope this is going to work. Oh, I was saying now, is anyone there? Oh, it's asking me for money.
ไม่มีเงินไปทำเปิดอะไรนะเขาไม่ back to the screen is anyone there is anyone logged in give me a thumbs up if it's working I can only see the screen that's been graffitied all over oh yeah you have to go to Chrome oh right I see and you have to click on that link that I sent you before sure sure it's not a Zoom thing it's it's, it's a Chrome extension so ah well that installs requires installing Chrome so. yeah I just had to do that this afternoon but it only takes a second. And you have to give Google your heart. Ah, uh, it it takes more than a second on my operating system, unfortunately. Oh, oh no! I'm really sorry, Tom. <laughs> no, it's all right. Oh, I don't know whether I can stay for the whole thing anyway. Um, oh, right. you should definitely watch it. Why don't you watch it on Netflix anyway, and we all just start together? Yeah, that might work. Um, I think I've got to jump out of the call for a bit. Give me a thumb up if you've actually got it working, someone. How are you going, Michael? Me? Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna not gonna hang around for the movie. Oh, oh okay. okay. I'm gonna take off. Thanks. Oh, See funny. you next week. Yeah, I like your whiteboard. Thank you. Yes. Um, it'd be productive if I had some stuff on there. All right. See you next week, Mike. See ya. I apparently can't leave the meeting because it's still trying to let me draw over stuff. I don't know how to turn off drawing over things. So it's just... I'm going to stop sharing. How about that? Did that work? All right. Um, I'm going over. Yeah. Oh, yeah, people are here. Woohoo! People are coming. So I hope you can um, install Chrome and come and join us for this fantastic movie. Uh, and shall I leave the camera on? Is there any point in doing that? No, no. Okay. All right, I'm going to go. I see you all. Everyone, it's made me very happy. See you. Is it Gural? How do I pronounce your name? Gaur? Gaurab. 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 Yeah. Gaurab. See you, Gaurab. Okay, thank you. See you, Evan. See you, Oliver, Andrew, and Anne, and Aaron, and Sean, and Iris, and Sage, and Nathan, and Shrey, and Chandler, and Jonah. See you all. People around. <laughs>